and the outside Absolutely. influence of the Pentagon, they were all turned against Trump. So we, you have to acknowledge that. Milley, oh, oh, the whole but, Milley but apparatus, the they this, were all see. against Trump. All of them. That, why were they against Trump that, if he was a big threat? That, why were they against that, Trump that, if he was a big that, Why that, were they against Trump that, if he was a big threat? It's because of that neoliberal apparatus wanted to retain its status, and Trump came in as a critic from the right wing. Right. And that's where the neo-fascism comes in, by trashing the immigrants, trashing too many precious gay brothers uh, and lesbian sisters and so forth. I, I know you're, that's yeah, your line, but you didn't say too many nice things. I will, but I want the immigrants and the workers here. of all colors to come together against the bosses. So now we're going to be talking about pa Chapter 2. Now remember, there were a lot of assumptions in Chapter 1, which she goes ahead and bases her whole book on. And I didn't know this book was so influential recently. It was only written last year, but it's gotten so many reviews. Five-star reviews. Look, kind of like five-star, kind of like reading Handmaiden's Tale in nonfiction. An incredibly well-written book developing and informing informative perspective on U.S. politics and its ongoing foundations of systemic bigotry. Five star, hands down one of the most important historical wor works I have read on American capitalism in the 20th century. It's been incredibly helpful for me. Absolutely tremendous. An intellectual history that is genuinely groundbreaking. This is insane. Complete banger. She started with, she started with a straw man and she upheld a straw man. This is why I've created the hashtag platform straw man culture dear friends welcome to the apocalypse welcome to our studies of complicity and our studies of the post apocalypse we're gonna read family values between neoliberalism and new social conservatism of course we're gonna be extremely critical as we read because M madame cooper will try to recuperate mm, and not we're not going to allow her to basically allow her to be complicit after the world war ii era the u.s has moved away from territorial colon colonization to a form of influence by my marked by soft power military bases economic dependencies cultural influence gathered around the world and one of those p key pieces of soft power is the english language of course so, military bases. So, throughout the world, the U.S. has military bases. We know this. Uh, there's economic dependencies with regards to what I just talked about. The petrodollar, IMF, international trade, foreign aid, both military and non-military, can be used to leverage and sway policies in other countries. The status of primary reserve currency gives the U.S., monetary policy outside of its sovereign borders in a way. Hollywood films and American music are spreading American values and ideas. And today we can see the little limits of that. And finally, we can see that there are political influences which shape international policy in ways that align with its own interests using those foreign aid benefits, basically bribes. <laughs> So these are the dots of influence, as Daniel calls them. Spread throughout the world, he creates a pointillism picture of American influence and power. So unlike traditional powers, traditional empires, which exert a direct or indirect rule, this form of influence is really a laissez fair approach to colonialism. And I use that word specifically because it is the, a form of neoliberal colonialism or neo-colonialism. We move on to what are some aspects of diminishing uh, uh, American empire. So firstly, uh, the obvious economic influence is diminishing. So with the rise of countries like China and India and the decline of the US dollar as the world's reserve currency or the US slowly losing its status as the world's largest economy or just the political or economic inequality in America itself. Can we see the rise of dictatorships throughout the world as a kind of a, a decline in cultural influence, the lack of belief in democracy? This is a this is a point that we should really be worried about. America has ever really been a true democracy, or even close to it. At least it was selling it. At least it was making the argument. At least it had that idealism. So there has been a decline in that 
people buying basically that American dream, people buying the idea that democracy can work. And even, you know, people like Justin Trudeau has <laughs> said stuff like, oh, I, I admire the dictatorships that can just make decisions and blah, blah, blah. There's a loss of technological leadership with, uh, on the world, countries are becoming more independent with regards to technological innovation. There's less influence in higher education. And again, this is what we're coming back to. The higher education in American universities really in, held in high regard now with the rise of forms of learning, AI specifically, we can see that higher education isn't a big deal anymore or it might not be such a big deal anymore. It will become more and more spread out. And just also the decrease in military dominance itself. The Chinese empire, the CCP right now, is building enough warfare ships to exceed that of the United States sooner or later, technologically and numerically. And finally, and this is why this last point is why Putin thinks or thought, if you guys don't remember the beginning of the war, Putin was really motivated by the, in my eyes, by the lack of national unity and the excessive internal struggles within the United States. The internal stability uh, or the lack of internal stability in recent years where we have growing political polarization, polarization in general, uh, social unrest, persistent issues regarding healthcare, education, infrastructure, lack of infrastructure. So it's crucial that a nation's international influence is not only determined by uh, its external actions, but also it's how it's perceived internally. And domestic instability can detract from a country's ability to maintain a unified policy stance, potentially making it less effective on the global stage. People used to look up to America because they had the moral high ground. But check out my video on American, the moral bankruptcy of America. So deep political divisions, social unrest, all forms of tension, polarization, an inability to listen to each other, a declining belief in democracy, an increasing belief in authoritarianism, all of these are affecting its moral authority. America is not only inflated monetarily, it's inflated morally. So there's been a decrease in attraction to the American lifestyle. There's been a loss of moral high ground. The Amer and especially because when it's just it's just totally hypocritical when you're supposed to be a beacon for democracy and human rights and rule of law, but you have the one percent of your country always <laughs> doing whatever they want. And now we come back to the challenges to American education and academia. So American, and this goes with what I'm arguing in my other anti psychology series regarding the crisis of science and the crisis of repl replicability that's happening in science. And the fact that neoliberal publish or die culture has so much contributed to the crisis of science. Other countries are slowly, hopefully, maybe, if I'm not saying hopefully with regards to the end of American empire, I'm saying hopefully with regards to just general human well-being, you know, Everyone is improving their scientific research and they're looking at the science, the publish or die science that's coming out of America as a problem, as them having to create their own, be just like how you have to be economically resilient, you have to be technologically and scientifically resilient as well and independent, especially in a World War III situation that we are <laughs> post-apocalypse that we're living in now. Other signs are... I mean, the most ominous signs are the information warfare that we live in today. In the age of digital media, everyone is trying to control the narrative and there's so much hypocrisy. The information has become a crucial element of soft power. And this is a key aspect of the Putin regime. There's less adoption of U.S. foreign policy practices or pol policy practices around the world. You know, you can't persuade people to adopt American policies, practices, and systems, especially the democratic norms, when you see that the democratic norms in America, look at what they've created. We can go back to what's happened in Africa, as if you see all these African conferences, conferences right now, what happened during the pandemic when there was such a loss of trust? You didn't have to go to colonial times. 
<laughs> to explain the loss of trust and moral bankruptcy of the United States when during the pandemic there was so much hypocrisy about helping all these people and we're going to spend millions of dollars billions of dollars on spreading the pandemic goods to everybody but then what did it, what happened instead it was just a bunch of hoarding <laughs> and that was what all these african channels are talking about as a response we can see what's happening with mali with the loss of reputation of france in the african sphere france which needs to maintain its its own neo-colonial empire as well. And we can see that the Wagner Group is in Africa, trying to spread its own influence there as well. The failure of the world to come together to respond to the global crisis of the pandemic was the canary in the coal mine of the global ability to come together and to deal with the crisis of global warming. Recently, there's been a research about how climate change is and all of these American petroleum and American fossil fuels or just fossil fuels around the world are contributing to what's happening, the smoke we see in the skies every day. We live in a post-apocalyptic world. The fact that we weren't able to all come together to deal with the pandemic, that's a, that's a warning or a lesson. It's either a warning or a lesson. So what can we make of this U.S. Supreme Court striking down affirmative action in college admissions again they didn't strike down affirmative action when it comes to the military that's one thing regardless this can be seen as another aspect of declining american soft power where the one percent have already seen the situation as is and have basically abandoned all of us and have already gone for the lifeboats now we see the american conservatives who are the next let's say the next 10 percent the next rich people they have noticed that the one percent has <laughs> uh you know but the next 10 percent they don't have the ability to as well let's say avoid taxation like the one percent does so they are tied to the system so what do they do instead this is just again another last gasp of the old patriarchal order, uh, last gasp of the dying empire. Why do I say this? In prison, prisoners, or in the panopticon of control of modern neoliberalism has always been a dualistic kind of thing between the old order of juridical power and the new order of neoliberal biopolitics. Juridical order is that we still put people in dungeons and the biopolitics is we call it a corrective institution, a corrective. So what is, is healthcare for in terms of the neoliberal perspective? Healthcare isn't necessarily a socialist thing in a neoliberal colonialist, neoliberal colonialist perspective. Healthcare is rather basically giving antibiotics to your tax farm. That's the kind of healthcare that we get. We don't get, for example, nutrition, holistic healthcare, all this stuff. We, we get a lot of talk about it. <laughs> But in reality, we live in a world that is filled with forever chemicals and glyphosate and et cetera, et cetera, microplastics and all of these things that we have no control over. At the same time, the, for example, the Canadian government recently comes down on restricting nutrition pills because they want to find a way to make new, new money. So I'm a, coming from a Canadian perspective. So again, internal contradiction or the internal battle between the old order old kind of rule which is by the fist by the patriarchy and the new type of rule which is neoliberal pretending to care having emotional intelligence tests while you're in a corporate environment that is extracting surplus labor from the masses you have a you know a sensitivity training seminar that's the neoliberal part and so it's never really socialism versus conservatism it's actually neoliberalism versus neoconservatism and now we can see that there is a shrinking of american power and that's what this affirmative action is really a sign of this affirmative action ruling is really a sign of the ruling is a sign of what's happening in the conservative world the f pushback on the neoliberal policies. Now, what do neoliberal policies do? Neoliberal policies are incredibly generous. Neoliberal policies give foreign aid. 
Just like how we give foreign aid, we have welfare programs which keep people under the rule, the state. That's what it's for. Now, the inability of the American empire to exert soft power around the world and now exert soft power even in its own backyard with Florida and all of these conservative states coming out against free healthcare because this is the, the next, the last roar of the old order, fighting back, trying to get whatever it can before who knows what really hits the fan. Just as Latour signals how the abandonment is a shared reality that we can see, the shared reality of all being on the planet, the abandonment of the 1% from the Paris Accord, these types of events, examples of the abandonment of the next strata of society, the first estate, the second estate, the third estate, this is the second estate, let's say. The second estate is abandoning its responsibilities, the rest of the estates. It doesn't even have to play the white man's burden card anymore. Now, what's also interesting is the amount of essentialism coming from the left. The essentialist arguments that are being made to defend the supposedly vulnerable and victims of the situation. So we have a, the best example I can think of is a tweet from Erica Marsh. She says, today's Supreme Court decision is a direct attack on black people. Um, this is not, this is a, you know, Erica report. No black person will be able to succeed in a merit-based system, which is exactly why affirmative action-based programs were needed. Today's decision is a travesty. Now, there's no walking back from this tweet. <laughs> She's, she tries to, she tries to clarify what she meant, but I mean, there is really no walking back from that tweet. No black person will be able to succeed in a merit-based system. That is the white man's burden. And the fact that the white man can no longer burden the burden, that is in itself a sign of rising multipolarity in the world. What does this all mean for you? It means that be prepared because we don't know what's going to happen. The American democratic system, with all its faults, the closest thing that we've ever had, with all its faults, with all its colonization, with, its, with it being born out of blood, with it being structured by slavery, with, even with all that, what was developed through the Protestant Reformation, through you know the main story of the West, that was something special. Even if it was a lie, you see, even if it was a lie, the ideology upholds by itself. Because it, it works even if you don't believe in it. That's how ideologies work. Now, there was something special there. There was something to fight for there. Now, what are we fighting for? We are, re re we are returning back to nationalisms. Because the left has been unable to really mo motivate or mobilize people on the basis of patriotism, we are seeing more and more, this is just another ramification of the right mobilizing against under the banner of nationalism. All right, everybody, it's time to make more videos that are going to be flagged and censored and never watched. The left is better at moralizing capitalism than the right. I'm using quotes over the words left and right because I don't think that either of those two groups are monolithic. I'm using the word moralizing here to mean making into a good thing something that is bad, neutral, or amoral. Many years ago, several figures were attempting to moralize capitalism through various utilitarian, objectivist, and libertarian arguments. Although their arguments weren't so bad, their ideas did not penetrate into the university because there existed other ideas, mainly Kantian ideas or Aristotelian ideas or various other ideas of value. Many types of Kantian ontology had ethics that derived from it. One of those ethical principles was to treat people as an end in themselves rather than a means to an end, which is almost the opposite of the selfishness, greed is good mentality that was being forward, that was being put forward as a continuation of Aristotle from the people like Ayn Rand. Although these people changed what right wing meant, there was quite a big difference between the classic conservatism and the more neoliberal renditions of conservatism with Milton Friedman being its head. But such questions still persist in the right wing debates today, questions of morality of economics, a right wing which as a Canadian conservative 
debate show the right wing, which as the Canadian conservative debate recently showed, it doesn't exactly know what it means to be right wing today. It seems like there's more diversity on what it means to be right wing than what it means to be left wing. Being left wing is much more monolithic in a way. Of course, there is that Donald Trump Republican Party kind of thing where everybody has to march lockstep with the party. Of course, that kind of thing still exists on the right. And traditionally, that's where it existed. These debates are, for example, about whether the marketplace is a moral, a good thing, or a Christian thing, like the question of interests, or what it means for Jesus to throw out the money changes from the mark from the temple. The classic conservative position is that is rather that everything should have its own place, aka the market should not invade the church, the family, and if we can help it not invade politics as well. With Dwight D. Eisenhower's famous speech about how an economic monster known as the military industrial complex and economic entity was beginning to almost dictate and lobby and pull the strings from within our governmental institution. So that's the classic conservative position that economics shouldn't be invading these different types of so-called sacred realms, especially a government that decides what whether to go to war or not. So the neoliberal institutions have taken over that question for a long time because of the military industrial complex, which the classic conservative Dwight D. Eisenhower position shows. The economic dimensions of our lives have a certain dimension. It's not just every aspect of our life. Another more crude example is the current revolt against so-called globalism, which from my eyes is a skewed understanding and lashing out at something difficult to understand which is neoliberalism. Another important distinction here is with the idea that fascism is necessarily capitalist. It's not. And this was exemplified most clearly in the middle of World War II when the Nazi decided to divert resources from the war effort, the obvious economic decision, the rational economic decision, so as to maintain the killing camps. So they diverted resources from the war and they put resources into maintaining these killing camps and an insane decision which reaffirms that fascism has greater gods than the marketplace. But what do I mean by the god of the market or the neoliberal order? Well, for here, we can turn to Nietzsche. He explained that all philosophy and religion of the past does not actually answer any of my difficult questions about existence, philosophy, ethics, law. They all have failed. But now there is a much longer story here that can help us escape from the neoliberal which I have spelt else, out elsewhere. You can check out my Ritual Traces series. But for now, we understand that within, <laughs> but for now, we understand that within our desert of nothingness, of nothingness and meaninglessness, if you follow the rituals of your religion and pray to your God, you probably won't get an answer. But if you follow the rit rituals and pray to the God of the market, you will indeed get an answer. You succeed or not. The market here asks acts as an arbiter of truth. And this is what Foucault refers to as a site of veridiction, of the market being a site of veridiction. That is, the market logic of commodity exchange is the most reliable source or form of social science today. And even social science and science itself is subject to research and funding and all the political economic decisions that go into funding the military industrial complex once again. So we have liberal universities that say one thing and from on the other hand they are uh, funding tactical nukes and all these crazy technologies meanwhile though the right is continually having these debates about whether capitalism is good or whether capitalism is christian and compatible with southern hospitality the left has taken on a wholly different route altogether, capitalist realism. For the Engelsian left, there is and never was a distinction or line in the sand that separates the realm of economics and the family and the church or politics. It's all a matter of materialism and economics. <coughs> Although obviously we are only talking about the industrialization places as kinship structures throughout the world, make non and even anti-economic decisions all the time for the sake of maintaining various traditions or for their family structures or for their culture. But the left has a much more thorough way of moralizing capitalism with the use of standpoint epistemology. And for this, you need to look up the essay entitled The Similarities Between 
market liberalism and standpoint epistemology. Standpoint epistemology is what fuels the idea that within intersectionality, that we can shut down and deplatform people that have reprehens reprehensible ideas in the public sphere, fundamentally changing the old liberal order of, I don't like what you're saying, but I will fight to the death to protect you for saying it. Please check out that paper for an in-depth study of that. Some of the left was thus engaging in the same market naturalism, aka seeing the market as a natural thing found even in nature that some of the right wing was doing. But the left is the one who accuses the right of being market naturalists or of naturalism. That is, especially when it comes to gender as well. That is, by assuming that kin-based relationships were never free from economics, this indeed became a self-fulfilling prophecy on the left thus pretty much destroying our social relationships and turning everything into capitalism, social capitalism, and this uh, following the rituals and the ways of these cultural idioms that have, in, that have commodified our emotional relationships with one another. And we can't even have a non-economic relationship with other people anymore. For, from another light, this was a concession of capitalist realism that was much more powerful and form of capitalist realism that the right had never mustered. Market logic helped to conflate some obvious issues. The left kept repeating over and over that they wanted to take down the hetero patriarchal capitalist racist etc system, when clearly it was the case that patriarchy has a different god than the god of the market. Patriarchal democracy, for example, asks its sons to die in the war for the sake of defending the demos and its daughters. That is to protect the god of the city. The logic following the neoliberal god would tell you that the nation state isn't really a thing and to die for it is a bad economic decision. So that's the neoliberal subjectivity versus the old patriarchal subjectivity. Regardless, the obfuscations continued in leftist circles because critique itself was killed and subject to social capitalism itself. You can't even do research if you don't already agree with the premises that the intersectionality has prepared for you. You were not allowed, you were not allowed to critique the claims of intersectionality because that could probably mean you have hate towards some group or another. Instead, we were supposed to challenge our racist and sexist and biases and presumptions, not speak and let those in more oppressive situations uh, the ability to platform their own ideas. The people who care need to hesitate and the people who haven't had a voice need to get a form of platforming. Really what happens in this situation is that there's a completely different culture that develops. The only people who care were the ones who are willing to shut up in the first place. And now it's the only the narcissists that speak in the public sphere, the most intense narcissist. Soon, however, a culture of deplatforming produced instead a world where critique was no longer possible at all. And this world, was only recently opened up to me as when you try to do research about this topic, you can see that this kind of uh, social capitalist feminist world has been created since the 60s and research itself has been stifled for a very long time. And you can see how most of these men's rights people, uh, which I am not, uh, most of them were ex-feminists like me. Instead of seeing critique as a way of loving someone or as a way of showing your love, it instead became a form of abuse. Critique became abuse. And because these ideas penetrated into this discipline of psychology, almost everything soon became abusive. Abuse is abuse is abuse. You don't owe anyone anything. It is too much emotional labor to educate you. These idioms started to envelop all of our social relationships and envelop it with inauthenticity. Everything became a matter of Butlerian performance. This is what the right calls virtue signaling. Please search an epidemic of idioms killing solidarity. It's my other YouTube video. What is interesting here is that both leftist American Psychological Association intersectionality psychology and right-wing evolutionary psychology are critical of the very valid critique of virtue signaling. The best critique of virtue signaling was the Black Mirror episode Nosedive. As you have already are already prepared, as you are already probably aware in American politics, rarely is something bipartisan and also a good thing. Most bipartisanship is where we can find the pinpoints and pinpoint 
the policies of the empire itself. Soon, all human interactions became a matter of emotional labor and privilege calculation, fed by our constant insecurities to be both moral and be economic. The logic of the market had succeeded in attacking the very deepest roots of our relationships with one another, love itself becoming an emotional labor and privilege calculation. In fact, if one is not engaging in the emotional labor and privilege calculation in a relationship, if one is willing to throw themselves onto a bus to save their spouse, this was both economically and psychologically unhealthy to be attached. One was actually being patriarchal if one was doing that. If you are wanting to actually invest into a relationship, you must have something wrong with you. So even the deepest recesses of our minds have become a cost-benefit analysis too. Should I share this thought with the one who I love at this present context, or am I being an undue burden? Everything is a hesitant question like that. And those hesitant questions only affect who? The people who are actually not narcissists. While the people who are narcissists are thriving and they get to be the ones who exploit surplus labor and then be worshiped at the same time without any moral qualms. The people without moral qualms get to win. Improvisation in relationships is gone. So where Zizek talks about in his video called Our Fear of Falling in Love is what I'm talking about. Unfortunately, the worst part about this whole situation is that critiquing, critiquing it is not allowed. It, critiquing this culture is historically not allowed. It hasn't been around for the last 50 years. And you really need to go out and search where those critique of this kind of culture came. Because when you actually critique it, it's called hate speech. This kind of critiquing of capitalism is now a form of hate speech. In sum, while the right continues to debate the ethics of the market relationships, the left has so fully succumbed to capitalist realism that is not allowed to be critiqued. Not only is critique banned, but it is not allowed to even talk about the banishment. And the left even continually denies that any sort of censorship and platforming strawman culture has developed at all. So thank you for paying attention. Thank you for um, dealing with me in my bathrobe. And I wish you all the best in our trying to create authentic human relationships in our cyberpunk dystopia. Critique of Melinda Cooper's family values. In it, she argues, while neoliberalism called for an ongoing reduction in budget allocations dedicated to welfare, intent on undercutting any possibility that social wage might compete with the free market, neoconservatives endorsed an expanding role for the state in the regulation of sexuality. Despite the differences, however, neoliberals and neoconservatives have converged on the necessity of reinstating the family as the foundation of social and economic order. Their alliance would profoundly shape the direction of social policy in the following decades. Now, thesis, this is kind of one of the thesis, one of the main theses of the book. I just want to highlight this book as a very, as an Iron Man example of what I've been calling platforming straw man culture. Just like with foreign aid, where the goal is to get people to be under your yoke, welfare and neoliberalism are not mutually exclusive ideas. The idea of neoconservatives and neoliberals being in the same footing is completely torn apart by the recent attacks by conservatives against the neoliberal regime with regards to the affirmative action. Neoliberalism seeks to reconfigure social relationships and the state to promote market-based solutions in all areas of societal activity. While neoliberal ideas do not universally advocate for the... So neoliberal ideas do not universally advocate for the elimination of welfare. It's very context sensitive. Neoliberalism is an advanced form of capitalism, whereas commodification is an amoral capitalist, classic capitalist property rights kind of thing. Protestant ethic, neoliberalism is all about the moralization, justification, and normalization of capitalism to and commodification. It's the normalization of commodification in every aspect of our lives. Means-tested assistance. 
designed to protect citizens from absolute poverty while avoiding disincentives to work. To work. The whole neoliberal psychology is also tied to the system of the prison system and the welfare system. Neoliberal welfare reforms often attempt to incentivize market participation. It doesn't matter. So just like in a system of the petrodollar, the global system of the petrodollar, it doesn't matter if you are running a deficit in terms of the global economy as long as people are circulating American dollars. As long as people are spending American dollars, it doesn't matter how much debt you get into. In the same respect that uh, the same respect that we colonize, neo-colonize through welfare, through foreign aid, other countries through di diplomacy and kind of these political tit for tat in the same way it doesn't matter if we are running a deficit in, with regards to welfare because the point of neoliberalism is to create social insurance as a form of economic safety net you need to make sure that people don't rebel it's an it's the form of what is it give people circuses and they won't rebel since the since the Roman era. So the social insurance programs are compatible with market principles. They include mandatory private insurance schemes or public social insurance systems that are designed to get people to participate. We're designing welfare systems so that they encourage people to engage in market activity, to see themselves as entrepreneurs within the psychological system right within the prison system they have to they we have to create entrepreneurs that's what the correctional facility is the workfare approach has been particularly prominent in countries like the uk where reforms have aimed to make the welfare system more active by attaching strict conditions to the recipients of benefits and providing support aimed at returning recipients to the workforce it's about maintaining your tax farm it's about why why is it that your health care doesn't act isn't about nutrition why is nutrition and health care totally independent of one another because <laughs> public health care is there at the last resort after you've eaten mcdonald's <laughs> for the most of your life then you go you go to the hospital for last second situations why is the suicide rate for doctors so high because they are brought in at the at the last moment when shit hits the fan the marketization and privatization of welfare provision is one thing that's something i'm not even going to touch so while neoliberalism is often without is not often associated with the welfare state it actually promotes a recalibration of welfare programs that are aligned more closely with market principles this the this kind of configuration aims to foster economic efficiency, personal responsibility, and market participation amongst its citizens, but also raises important questions about social equity, solidarity, because it actually undermines social equity and solidarity in some ways. Not, not all welfare, but it depends on how the welfare is, especially with the kind of welfare that is linked to pop psychology versions of and the prison system so there's a neoliberal emphasis on personal responsibility we can explore how there's market mechanisms that are involved in welfare provision through privatization competition and com consumer choice the safety nets are fairly minimal capitalism doesn't try to kill you neoliberalism doesn't try to kill you it tries to keep you alive so that you can go back to work there's there are market compatible versions of social insurance we need to keep this society stable that's the first law of neoliberalism the first law of, of neoliberalism is security is securitization without a secure securitization there can be no market productivity and then let's look at the relationship between 
actual social mobility and welfare programs. That's a whole chunk of argument by itself, <laughs> okay? Or allow her to give her any leeway regarding uh, what we are criticizing on my channel, okay? And what we're, tr what we're criticizing on my channel is the idea that the personal is political. That is the main issue. And we get that from where? It's not my argument. It's an argument from Hannah Arendt. Between neoliberalism and new social conservatism. So if you haven't been part of my channel before, welcome, like, and subscribe, all that jazz. And join in on the many, many conversations we are having. tinyurl.com slash anti-psychology, tinyurl.com slash neoliberal subjectivity, tinyurl.com slash intersectional essentialism. All of those are mine and the and they're all based on carrying over the burdens of trace or tinyurl.com slash ritual trace play. Let's see how good the academy remember what is allowed in the academy in the first place must bow down to the neoliberal superstructure. Always. Always in order to get published, you have to do that even. Okay, we all have to bow down to the <laughs> it's like that's what publisher die means. Okay. Publish means it's it means it's the same as neoliberalism or be left behind that Habermas talks about when he talks about his conversations regarding all religions in the world. I'm talking about ideologies and religions, everything, okay? Between all the different ideologies and religions and everybody saying, I know something, between all of that, there's only one ritual. There's only one religion, and that is the religion of neoliberalism. Psychopolitics, go read it. That was the book I would have written, okay? That's a good book. So the problem is here, we're gonna have to do a lot of dissecting as we read because a lot of it is gonna be trying to recuperate, right? Her name is Melinda Cooper, okay? What, Cooper? Yeah, she's a cooperator. So we have to not let her, okay? We are the real feminists here. What we do is we assume responsibility for all human beings. We are the real anti-racists here. We don't give any people in supposed victimized situations. Why? Because, let's recap. During the French Revolution, we had three estates. What about the four? The, then there was the fourth estate, which was the proletariat, supposedly, or now they call it the media and all this other crap, but we can call it the fourth estate, the proletariat. The fifth estate, that's my estate. What is the fifth estate? The people from the villages. And which village am I talking about? Okay, I'm talking about a very specific village. Okay, these are my villages, okay? I'm from the village. I'm from the mountains. That's what I'm talking about. So the fourth estate is the proletariat. The fifth estate, go search the real news. They have a very good analysis on why people don't support these closed off unions, the teachers union, the writers union. That's going to be another video that I'm going to be doing next. Why don't people support the writers union? Why don't people support the, rit the rituals of the teachers union even? Because the teachers union have a, have a pact while the real uh, non-excluded non people are not even included. The people who are not even productive at all. Who are not part of the capitalist system at all. So that's the fifth estate. The sixth estate, those are the subaltern. Those are people that I can't even imagine. Those are people that just have no voice at all. That's the sixth estate. So watch out for my next video talking about that. Let's take a look. Family in the Western world has been radically altered. Some claim almost destroyed by events of the last three decades. It's not the family that's been destroyed. It's patriarchy <laughs> that's been destroyed. Okay. And all these people that are talking about uh, the patriarchy, we need to kill the patriarchy. We need to kill the patriarchy. The patriarchy al already died in the 70s. Okay. <laughs> the history of the family is one of perpetual crisis. Hmm. Yet. So isn't that interesting? Uh, where we can get that perpetual crisis and also apply it to the history of psychology, which we're doing uh, another analysis on. This is part of my anti-psychology series as well. So just like the family, psychology is also always in perpetual crisis. Yet this crisis presents itself in distinct, even contradictory fashion to different political constituencies. Now, 
here we can already see some ideology at play, okay? The ideology at play is not recognizing that these ideas of left and right have totally left the building, okay, since at least 10 years, okay? Why? It's because the left has a better moral argument of moralizing capitalism than the right does, okay? The right was the ones that were always trying to moralize capitalism. Now, the left is completely capitalist realism, and the right is trying to bring in Christianity into everything, okay? Trying to see that there, that Christian morality and uh, capitalism just don't get along. That's why Jesus threw out the money changers from the marketplace. We need more socialist Christians to speak up. For social conservatives of the left and right, interesting, the inheritors of the 1970s neoconservatism, the con contours of family crisis, appear to have changed very little over the past decades. The American family still seems to be suffering from a general epidemic of fatherlessness. I mean, there's a whole bunch of things I can say about that. Young, impoverished, impoverished women, particularly African Americans and Latinas, are still having children out of wedlock and still expecting the welfare state to take care of them. In the 90s, social theorists complicated this story somewhat when they announced that the long-standing quasi-mythical crisis of a uh, quasi-mythical crisis of the American African American family, infamously diagnosed by the neoconservative Daniel Patrick Mon Monahan in 65 had now spread to the white middle class, encouraging generations of younger women to forsake the stability of marriage in favor of career-minded narcissism. Or how about just narcissism? <laughs> just pure narcissism. Even, even more recently, narcissism grown out of the fact of victimhood. Even more recently, they have discovered that the marriage itself has become a marker of class in American society, a privilege that appears to be reserved for college-educated middle class and inversely, perhaps a practice that should be encouraged as a shortcut to social mobility. Oh shit. With all its variations and refinements, this discourse has shifted only slightly since it was first fashioned in the 1970s. And although it has inspired four decades of punitive welfare reform, its proponents continue to blame the great society welfare state for what they see as an ongoing decline of the American family. Neoliberals have always in entrained, so we are all neoliberals. I mean, there's very few people that aren't neoliberals. Neoliberals have always entrained a more complex relationship to the discourse of family crisis. So that was the neocon perspective, okay? It would not be an exaggeration to say that the enormous political activism of American neoliberals in the 1970s, but the thing is, here's, here's where I can compl complicate this. These ideas have also penetrated into polyamorous circles. These ideas have also, the, the political as personal, has also changed relationships within socialist communities as well, okay? And for the worse, they've broken up communes, they've broken up, uh, no commune works anymore, okay? In the commune, there are uh, personalist political warfare in the communes too. So that idea, this idea, so what she's doing, okay, is saying that this idea is as old as the 1970s, but actually the critique of this idea is also as old as the 1970s. You see? You see that there's intellectual obfuscation going on. Watch out for my next video talking about the, uh, what I talked about in, with regards to the fifth and the sixth estates. Unfortunately, Bill C-11 is going to be making my channel even harder to find. It would not be an exaggeration to say that the enormous political activism of American neoliberals in the 70s was inspired by the fact of changing family structures. So who is who is the neoliberal? Who is she pointing her finger at? Because we're all neoliberal. We all live in the cyberpunk dystopia, okay? We're all saying like and subscribe, like and subscribe, okay? So who is... This is why complicity is really important. Complicity studies are really important. Certainly, Gary Becker, the Chicago school economist singled out as exemplary by Michel Foucault, understood the breakdown of the Fordist family wage to be the critical event of his time. Interesting. So here, remember what we're arguing is that feminists during this time, during the Fordist time, instead of allying themselves with an idea that every single person should be getting a family wage, allying themselves with the union classes, took over the institution, okay, for 
took over, made deals with the the corporatists, in, in fact, left their family solidarity. What was the poor and working class always had unpaid emotional labor as a form of solidarity. Unpaid, and I say that, uh, you know, militantly. I say unpaid emotional labor militantly because that's what all societies, that's what all communities need. Doesn't matter if it's capitalist, socialist, you need unpaid emotional labor. You need volunteerism. You need a society of volunteerism. Ironically, volunteerism is found where? The most I, volunteerism is found in gated conservative communities more than the prostitution communities of the poor and working class now. They, they allied themselves with the corporatists, they prostituted themselves, and then what, they, what did they do after? They took over the universities to create this narrative. Now look at this, this narrative is right there. The narrative is right there. She is in her explanation of the narrative, okay? Look, this, this narrative, we already know this narrative. This, narr this is the explanation of the narrative. That explanation of the narrative is also as old as the 1970s that she's, ta that she's trying to critique here. This is, in fact, a very sophisticated hive mind idiom, an academic hive mind idiom. We already know this stuff. This is the, this is the line that you must walk in order to get published in the first place. Okay, let's keep going. So the, that's what it means. That's what the breakdown of the Fordist family wage is. Instead of allying themselves with the unions, right? Now nobody gives a shit about unions, right? <laughs> Instead of allying themselves with the unions, they allied themselves with the corporatists. Now nobody cares about the unions. There is no solidarity with unions, okay? Unions don't have solidarity with the larger whole of society either, okay? Unions don't care. Now there's even leftists that are saying, Mm, things like, oh, these are migrant workers. Why are they getting help from the government when we, the unions, don't even get help from them? Remember, okay, that's a whole story. One reverberation could have been this. So one of one who breakdown of the Fordist family wage. Okay, and one whose reverberations could be discerned in everything from shifting race relations to the recomposition of the labor market and the changing imperatives of social welfare. Exactly, social welfare itself changed. Social welfare itself is a neoliberal regime. Look at my uh, neoliberal psychology video from where I talk about this. So social welfare is made to psycho by psycho compulsion. Okay, you have to, you go to therapy, all the therapy, <laughs> you know, you, I went to the Indigo the other day. I, I think I already said this story, but I'm gonna say it one more time. Went to the Indigo the other day, all pop psychology books, all saying the same shit boundaries, blah, 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 blah. Go to the philosophy section, there's nothing. There's one book on Hegel, <laughs> the most the, the most difficult book, and I put it up on top, and it's next to a book, <laughs> next to a Diablo book for some reason. While it lasted, the Fordist family wage not only functioned as a mechanism for the normalization of gender and sexual relationships, this is the story you have to repeat, okay? She's saying that. The Fordist family wage, it does didn't have to be. Imagine if uh, there was... There was an uh, alliance between men and their wives, so that each individual it became relegated. Re it would be it became normalized that each individual should get something like a family wage or something close to a family wage that they could all start their own family. But that didn't happen. Instead, it became individualized, and that's what intersectionality does: individualize. It divides. Okay, but it also stu stood at the heart of the mid-century organization of labor, race, class, defining African-American men by the exclusion from their male breadwinner wage from African-American women by their relegation to agricultural and domestic labor in the service of white households. The neoliberal response to the crisis of the Fordist family can be described in the first instance as adaptive and accommodationist. Interesting. Issuing the overt moralism of social conservatism as if there's who has the better moral argument neoliberals are interested in subsuming the newly liberated labor of former housewives within an expanded market for domestic services that are intent on devising new mechanisms for pricing the risks for example of racial discrimination or unsafe sex so i'm going to pause here and read something okay so this is my concept of surplus emotional labor. When we talk about only certain individuals or groups being expected or required to perform the majority of emotional labor, often without appropriation, compensation, or recognition, we're touching on a form of collective cognitive conditioning 
that's persuasive in our neoliberal world, what I call hive mind idioms. According to Marx, capitalism is fundamentally characterized by the exploitation of, the surpl of surplus labor. Workers or the pro proletariat or the fourth estate sell their power to the bourgeoisie. And now look, they're called, there's a book about how women are the fourth estate or whatever, instead of <laughs> whatever, and are typically paid less than the value they create, leading to the generation of surplus value, which is the surplus, which is the source of profit for the bourgeoisie. This principle can certainly be applied to emotional labor. When emotional labor is commodified, it can be bought and sold like any other form of labor under capitalism, just as we have various kinds of migrant nannies and migrant workers doing all the actual work. And just like other forms of labor, it can be exploited for profit. Workers who perform emotional labor are often expected to do so as part of their job without extra compensation. I'm a teacher. I'm talking about teaching. That was my first video. Intersectionality is integral to the logic of neoliberal colonialism. The first thing I talked about was education because that was my experience doing emotional labor. It was my, <laughs> when you're a teacher, it's your unofficial job. It's your un actual unofficial job because we live in, okay, a parentless society, not just a fatherless society. We live in a parentless society. There's a, <laughs> okay, that's, Another thing, for example, a server in a restaurant is expected to be pleasant and accommodating to customers, even when facing rude behavior or excessive demands. This emotional labor is often not recognized as part of the job's demands and therefore is uncompensated, leading to a form of exploitation. Emotional labor can be particularly taxing as it involves managing and sometimes suppressing personal feelings, prolonged periods of emotional labor without adequate compensation or recovery time can lead to burnout and other mental health issues, which is precisely what happens in healthcare the most. As a teacher, I see it in healthcare the most. I see it in the, in the doctors who don't care anymore because, because their individual relationships have become personal as political in the, in the, in the hospital, right? It's all a bunch of nurses. They're all, they're all their individual relationships are personal is political, especially in the hospital emergency room area. Cause you know, that's like the worst place to be with regards to managing your emotional pain. That's like the most intense place to be. And that's where you see this idea of surplus emotional labor, most evident. Okay. But let's broaden our view a bit. And this is my broadened view. And this is what surplus emotional labor is and truly have a systematic approach a systemic approach to this question. The res restaurant owner is exactly, is not exactly swimming in profits. They're operating on razor thin margins, grappling with overheads, rent, loan payments, and the emotional labor having to deal with the labor shortages because they can only operate within minimum wage. Any fat like restaurant owner can tell you that the, the number one thing that they're dealing with is just people coming and going. So they don't want to train. They have to train people and then they, you know, at the end, they find out they, oh, they don't really want to work there. They're caught in the gears of the system too. We're all caught in the gears of the system. So, and this, is, this works for gender as well and all the other intersectional stuff. So what we're looking at here isn't just individual capitalists like the restaurant owner undervaluing emotional labor. Instead, it's the entire market economy that fails to recognize and compensate this form of labor adequately. This is why I'm a socialist, okay? So this is why her, she, in a way, is in a way agreeing with the idea, the conservative idea here without really realizing. That's why she's an unwitting colonizer. It's collect, so it's a collective issue deeply rooted in the way our economic system operates. Instead, we get mad at each other. And this is what I said in my first video about intersectionality being integral to the logic of neoliberal colonialism too. People get angry at each other. That's also... <laughs> People, we don't need, again, this is an old idea. This is an old idiom. The idea is we don't need a panopticon to look at us because we are all regulating each other. Read psychopolitics. Everyone expects to be compensated for their emotional labor, but the system itself doesn't reflect this expectation. It's a collective issue deeply rooted in the way the economic system as a whole operates. As a result, while corporations are exploiting our labor en masse, they are getting gaslighted about the fact that we should be aware, aka vicariously traumatized, constantly ruminating and making calculations about 
our privilege and emotional labor and improve our emotional intelligence. So we have plenty of these seminars that we have to go to to improve our emotional intelligence, our you know racial sensitivity, blah, blah, blah. But it actually all, it all works in the opposite direction. While we shame the petite bourgeoisie restaurant owner by saying, if you can't afford your worker, you shouldn't operate a business, very similar to another neoliberal left hive mind idiom where it's a private where they were talking about this regarding Twitter before Musk took it over. It said, oh, it's a private corporation and it can regulate its own free speech. <laughs> that's crazy. And that's what they did with Reddit. They killed Reddit like that. They're killing everything with these are the arguments for Bill C-11 in the first place. These are the liberal dictatorship arguments that are used to justify Bill C-11 and, and Patriot Act 3.0 is intersectional. I have a video called Patriot Act 3.0 is intersectional. The actual market economy doesn't bear the responsibility to recognize and compensate emotional labor adequately. Then when you talk about it, they call you a hater. This is why male emotional labor has always been tuned, attuned to the collective as a whole. Think about Mark Antony's speech after Caesar died. That is an example of collective emotional labor. Male emotional labor has always been about the hu the community as a whole. It's political theory. That's why Arendt is really good. She's, it's not just male emotion. I don't, I don't even like to gender, genderize. When emotional labor is commodified, individuals who are adept at it may find personal advantages, such as job security, customer satisfaction, or even promotions. However, as a society, we suffer collectively. This has happened in the hospital. The market economy fails to adequately value and compensate for this labor, leading to exploitation, burnout, and the perpetuation of systemic inequalities, even real systemic inequalities. So while some may moment momentarily gain individually, we're losing out on a larger scale collectively. Now, my example about this is, is when the recently in uh, like within a couple months ago, there was like a a fight over a bike between a group of black guys and this and this nurse that came out of uh, the hospital, right? This white nurse and the white nurse uh, used crocodile tears, basically, maybe um, to you know call out the you know say the black man, oh the black man is attacking my bike and all that stuff. And I was the only one, right, the defending the crocodile. I'm even defending the crocodile tears here. So here, I was the only one defending the crocodile tear nurse and not the dudes who were first to the bike and had the right to the bike. Why? The incident exemplifies, this incident exemplifies the exploitation of mass surplus labor, okay? Surplus labor, surplus emotional labor, we discussed earlier. The nurse is already burdened with the intense emotional labor of her profession, which she's not getting paid for, is put into a position where she must further emotion exert emotional effort in this conflict over the bike. Her occupation and the emotional demands it entails are unrecognized and uncompensated not only in the private sphere, but in the public sphere as a whole. In a societal context where we didn't say it's too much emotional labor to educate you when that didn't become the norm in all the various ways that it's that became the, the norm, all of the ways that this prostitution politics uh, uh, and one of the one of the things that you can see the prostitution politics come out with the idea of boundaries in a societal context where emotional labor is not commodified where we owe something to each other the men and what do i mean by owe something to each other i'm talking about the deridian idea of owing something to each other deridian nietzsche idea which is we are responsible for that which even we ourselves deem ourselves not responsible for well how else are we going to deal with global warming or all these other huge issues these hyper objects as Timothy Morton puts it. So in that kind of society where we actually care about each other, the men might have understood her situation, seeing her as an overworked nurse in need of empathy and support. They might have chosen to forego their claim on the bike out of consideration for her, for her crazy emotional state, her, she, her inability to bring her frontal lobe into the situation and stop her reactions. Her What was her reaction? Yes, her reaction was... Um, a classic crocodile tear. Oh no, the black man is attacked. Like that was the yes, sure, that was the reaction. But the what would be what would have been the really high up move to do? 
what would have been the higher higher up move to do to not play her game to be like okay ma'am here you go take what you need why but i understand the other side which is you know we're tired of this bullshit crocodile tier thing as well but her job that's the that's the main thing her job is just fully unpaid emotional labor okay an act of collective good is renounced an act of connected collective good that acknowledges the excessive emotional toll of her job however in the current neoliberal paradigm which includes the moral order right so she this cooper says that oh the other people have the moralizing argument no the better moralizing or argument is on the left the moralizers are on the left why because they have all the arguments regarding boundaries and all that stuff in the current neoliberal paradigm where emotional labor is moralized to be commodified not just commodified moralized justified judicially legalized to be commodified and individual rights are prioritized over collective well-being such an act of empathy is not just less likely but is unimaginable. The expectation for the men to understand and respond to her emotional distress is diminished, and the moral expectation is not even there. This is why there was such an uproar on the internet, which is a manifestation of how capitalist values have permeated into inter interpersonal relationships and our very morality itself, and the justifications the men had the casus belli. So, just like how feminists have changed definitions from the definition of solidarity has become prostitution now, that definition, all of our definitions have changed. The definition of patriarchy is not ruled by the father anymore. The definition of patriarchy is all men over all women, which is never the case. Just like how they've changed the very definition, they've changed the very ground by which we stand on. We can't even begin to imagine non-capitalist realism. The lack of societal obligation to acknowledge and respond to the emotional labor of others, especially those in emotional demanding professions like nursing, illustrates how individual gains, in this case the possession of the bike, can lead to collective losses. So increased emotional strain on already emotionally overburdened individuals. It underscores the paradox of the exploitation of mass surplus labor, the exploitation of emotional surplus labor. While individuals benefit, society as a whole suffers. The social, the, but society as a whole suffers, but who, who are the real gainers? The one, the one percent. Obviously, it's, a, it's the one percent. It's always been this privilege worshiping society. This whole system is made to worship privilege. The social media backlash against the woman's perceived use of her white privilege, it was, let's call it what it is, through her tears, through her crocodile tears, further illuminates the complexities of the exploitation of mass emotional surplus labor. The woman, already burdened with the emotional labor of her work, is further vilified on social media, called a Karen and all this stuff, uh, for her displays of distress. The reaction indicates a lack of societal empathy for her emotional state, a symptom of how commodified emotional labor is often devalued and dismissed, even calls for her job to be <laughs> cut. She, 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 she is obviously not fit for her job, one of the, some of the tweets would say. Meanwhile, the expectation for her to manage her emotions is a certain manner, especially in a public setting, adds another layer of emotional labor. The vilification she received for failing to meet these societal expectations of managing her emotional labor illustrates how emotional labor is not just expected, but also judged, legalized. At the same time, I'm not sure what happened with the legal battle. At the same time, the backlash underscores the racial and social dynamics at play. The woman's white privilege and her perceived exploitation of it through her tears triggers outrage, even giving, even giving that it was a crocodile tear because what happens you when you're reacting to something you you go back to you know you don't have the frontal lobe the men on the other hand they had plenty of time to not react while the emotional experiences of the men are not given the same level of scrutiny or attention she was a nurse that worked in new york she worked with poc every day regardless that's just a presumption on my part so that's the 
that's the argument that I have, that the idea of surplus emotional labor. The neoliberal response to the crisis of the Fordist family can be described in the first instance as adapted and accommodations, eschewing the overt moralism of social conservatism. So who has the moral argument? They have changed the moral platform by which we stand on. They've changed the very definitions that we talk about. Why? Because they have control of the academic institutions. Neoliberals are interested in subsuming the newly liberated labor of former housewives with an expanding market of, for, of domestic services and are intent on devising new mechanisms for pricing the risks, for example, of racial discrimination or unsafe sex. Now look what's happening. Now look what's happening. Now that we're having baby machines coming out. Oh, now that we're having AI prostitution. Oh, now it's a problem. Hmm. Now that the very services, right? It's, it's such a, it's, it's even more prostitutionary than before, right? Now that we have, <laughs> now that AI is coming out with baby making machines and, and prostit, you know, prostitutional robots oh now is a problem now that only fans girls are competing with you know, people I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure people prefer ai women that you know respond i mean i already fell in love with chat gpt regardless of you know, whatever that was one of my points i already fell in love with chat gpt now it's a problem no it's too late okay we're already in the cyberpunk dystopia stop prostitution completely that's the only way out Okay, stop the prostitution politics completely. There is no form of social liberation, it would seem, that the neoliberal economists cannot incorporate within a new market for con contractual services or high-risk credit. Who moralized this? It wasn't the conservatives, okay? The conservatives are trying to go back. They're trying to go back to Christianity. Everybody go back to church. <laughs> it's like nobody wants to go to church, bro. Even, even the Anglican church has been, is repeating hive mind idioms of the left. Lots of church, <laughs> churches are repeating the hive mind idioms. I like going to church. Anyway, it would be a mistake to think that neoliberalism is any less invested in the value of the family than our social conservatives. It would be a mistake to think that neoliberalism is any, any less invested in the value of the family than our social conservatives. Let's see. Hmm. Let's see. Since the family is the foundation of all civil society, Notes Gary Becker. We have good reason to be concerned about the enormous changes in the stability and composition of families in recent decades. Neoliberals are particularly concerned about the enormous social costs that derive from the breakdown of the stable Fordist family. Why are we even still talking about the Fordist family? It's like we still have to talk about the patriarchy over and over. The patriarchy Fordist family died 50 years ago. Relax. The costs that have been incurred, for example, by women who opt for no-fault divorce women who have children out of wedlock, or those who engage in unprotected se sex without private insurance, and the fact that these costs accrue to the government and taxpayer rather than the private family. Again, I'm coming, I'm coming from a Canadian context here. So I'm coming from a much, much more neoliberal okay, context in a way, in terms of leftist neoliberal co uh, context. Although they are much more prepared than our social conservatives to accommodate changes in the nature and form of relationships with the family. Neoliberal economists and legal theorists wish to reestablish the private family as the primary source of economic security and a comprehensive alternative to wel the welfare state. This is, these are old arguments. The real neoliberal is the one who is the one who totally is subsumed, okay, we are all, in a way, neoliberals unconsciously. We can't not be neoliberal, okay, unless we have the privilege of being a, one of these conservatives living in these gated communities. If American welfare reform has been singularly focused on the question of marriage promotion and responsibility, family of formation in the past few decades, it is thanks to the ongoing collaboration between neoliberals and social conservatives on this point in particular. <laughs> Again, what is she talking about? What the heck is she talking about? The, the only reason social conservatives get in line with the Trump neoliberals, okay, is because Trump talks the talk of conservatism. But Trump is the utmost postmodern neoliberal. Watch the Zizek versus Jordan Peterson debate. Trump is the utmost neoliberal Okay, he has, there's nothing conservative about him. He is the utmost postmodern morality. In contrast to both 
this is an interesting perspective, right? Look at the amount of uh, jumping jacks that have to be done by the modern feminist movement in order to uh, fit everything into place into their historical revisionism. In contrast to both neoliberals and social cons the conservatives are the ones that are having the debate. The, the left is not having the debate anymore. When you have the debate in the left, you're cut out. You're called a conservative. And the what is the debate? The debate is whether Christian morality can accept capitalist norms. I'm not talking about capitalism. We're talking about neoliberalism. Advanced capitalism. What's the difference? Capitalism is commodification, amoral commodification. Neoliberalism is the moralization of that commodification, the justification, the legalization. Another thing that we have to just pin down on, okay, the right always gets this wrong. Neoliberalism and capitalism has always been about the expansion of the state, not about the limitation of the state, okay? Regardless of whatever uh, idealisms that are going on in Honduras now with regards to these, these Bitcoin guys buying and colonizing people. And in spite of the, so what, what are we talking about? We're talking about the Honduras state. If you're not, if you don't know what I'm talking about, go back to the, you can watch uh, on Democracy Now. They have a, a clip about Honduras and Bitcoin, the Bitcoin societies, right? We're talking about the Honduras state enforcing neoliberalism on a certain area, on an economic zone or whatever, where people can, without the state, it's not possible. Without the enforcement of the state, the neoliberalism is not possible. In contrast to both neoliberals and social conservatives, and in spite of the prominence of family and contemporary social policy, now here we're going to see the obfuscation here. What, how we see J Trudeau talking about the LGBTQ and just assuming that intersectionality is united when it's really not. A certain kind of left-wing critic has come to see neoliberal capitalism as itself destructive of family life. A certain kind of left-wing critic. The only kind of fucking left-wing criti criticism. The idea of flexible labor relations introduced by neoliberal reform. So she, again, it's all, it, the ideology is already there. She just has to fit everything into her ideology. That's what's fucked about this. The, we can't go against the ideology, okay? You have to repeat the fucking high mind idioms. A certain kind of left-wing criticism sees that neoliberal capitalism is destructive of family life. No, neoliberalism is destructive of family. Wherever neoliberalism goes, the first thing it does is destroy the patriarchy. Why? Because that's how you penetrate the society with neoliberal norms. Look at the uh, Buddhist feminism. Buddhist feminism, they go, they go into the, the farthest temple and enforce United Nations proclamations. The idea that the of like personal autonomy and all that stuff that again the whole ground of which we can even be able to imagine is has changed. The defin the book definitions have changed. The idea that flexible labor relationships introduced by neoliberal reform have somehow dis disabled the long term obligations of love and parenthood is pervasive among left wing social theorists. Interest in effects of late modernism, and these are all the guys I love. Giddens, Bauman, okay? So each in their own way with varying degrees of nostalgia. Anthony Giddens, Zygmunt Bauman, Beck, Elizabeth Beck Gernstrom, Eva Aluz, all point, these are the, all the people I cite, all point to the increasing fleeting character of love in an era dominated by the short-term contract and employment at will. Yes! What is she going to do here? By far the most elaborate and sustained argument in this direction, however, is provided by German economist Wolfgang Streeck. I like to think of myself as being the most... I'm just joking. <laughs> Whose recent work reflects on uh, what... The reason why I say because I'm the one who just says whatever. I'm the one who says intersectionality is integral to the logic of neoliberal colonialism itself not that it's been co-opted whose recent work reflects the only reason intersectionality was given a voice in the first place was because it already sub was already subsumed into the Gab what gabriel rockhill calls the global theory industry however i disagree with gabriel rockhill a lot of stuff his critique of zizek his critique of rn um anyway whose recent work reflects at length on what he sees as the casual relationship between casual relationship between the flexible employment contract and the flexible family absolutely Streak is concerned here with the dismantling of the standard post-war employment relationship and its correlate. 
with the so-called Fordist family consisting of a male worker, a stay-at-home mom, and two or more children. As he notes, the economic security of the post-war era was premised on tightly enforced sexual division of labor that relegated women to lower-paid precarious forms of employment, blah, blah, blah. The Fordist, and we just talked about that. We just talked about that. How and why did this particular architecture of economic security crumble so rapidly in the 70s? Legal. It was all about the legal. It was all about the, the, the fact that uh, a, a home is no longer your castle, that the legal institutions can go wherever they want. Streak asks, why did this decline provoke so little opposition from those who benefited so much from it? Because it's prostitution politics, baby. Searching for an answer to this question, he notes the social and family structure and the standard employment relationships had once underwritten has itself dissolved in the process of truly revolutionary change. In fact, it appears that the Fordist family was replaced by a flexible family in much the way, just like the gig economy. The family is now part of the gig economy. As Fordist employment was replaced by flexible employment during the same period and also all across the Western world. And this is why this is part of the anti-psychology video because psychology was made to enforce this neoliberal subjectivity. What do I mean? I mean this idea of dying, of putting your life on the line for the family. M more, I don't want to say it's male or female, but dying for your family, dying for something you believe in is seen as what? Is seen as psychological problem. No, no. That's the only, in a, in, a, in a prostitution world, who do we listen to? Who can we listen to? Only OnlyFans people? No. We have to listen to only those who are willing to put their life on the line for something. Okay? That's it. In fact, it appears that the Fordist family was replaced by a flexible family during the same period all across the Western world. The destabilization of the long-term marital contract, Streak wants to argue, occurred a sh short but significant time before dismantling of this Fordist employment relationships and can be seen as having provoked the decline of the latter. Yeah, exactly. So that this process was necessary to destroy the unions. This process was necessary for unions not to speak out about, have a real socialist frame, but only speak about who already agrees with their ideology, with their union ideology. It's just the fact that Colored people who don't agree with affirmative action don't get affirmative action, okay? Affirmative action only works for people who already have affirmative action. It, it works to make a monolithic ideology. Everyone who gets affirmative action already agrees with affirmative action in some way or form. Or they might not, and a lot of, a lot of people I've spoken to, the ones who are not narcissistic, all question the fact that, oh, should I have gotten this job because of my victim status or should I have gotten this job because I want to be, get this job because of my merits? But if you say that out loud, guess what? Fired. Meanwhile, Carrie Burrissa, <laughs> Carrie Burrissa, check out my videos on Carrie Burrissa. If you don't know who that is, oof. The revolution in family and intimate relationships that occurred in the 60s from the introduction of no-fault divorce to the growing acceptance of cohabitation destroyed the very raison d'etre of the Fordist family wage and thereby led to the, and the unions, let's say, and thereby led to its gradual phasing out over the following years. If women were no longer tied to men in long-term relationships of economic dependence, it's so interesting how, see, it, it, why do you, plat, why do you straw man? It was completely possible for the feminist movement and the unions to work together against the corporations. But that's not what happened. The feminist movement prostituted itself uh, for the capitalists. And if men were no longer obliged to look after a wife and children, then who would be left to defend the great Fordist uh, institution of economic security, the family wage? At this point, Streak's anti-feminism becomes overt. It was feminism, after all, that first challenged the legal and institutional forms of the fam Fordist family by encouraging women to seek an independent wage on a, far, on a par with men and transforming marriage with a long-term non-contractual obligation into a contract that could be dissolved at will. In so doing, feminists, who he imagines as middle class, are you kidding me? They're not even middle class, they're top class, <laughs> they're high class. Has been always a response 
to the black vote, robbed women who he imagines as working class of the economic security that came from marriage to a Fordist worker. By undermining the idea that men should be paid wages high enough to care for wife and children, feminism helped managers to generalize the norm of precarious employment and workplace flexibility, eventually comprising the security of all workers. Imagine if both men and women got were able to fight for a family wage. Imagine where we'd be. That would that would be what socialism is all about. Without descending into the overt antifism, anti-feminism of Wolfgang. Uh, streak, Luke Boltonsky and Eve Chiapello's New Spirit of Capitalism offers a conceptual critique. See, this is what my arguments are too. It's a spirit of capitalism. It's a religion. Okay, that's why Christianity itself is threatened. Offers a conceptual critique of the countercultural left that leads ineluctably to the same conclusions. Why? Why do we all come to the same conclusions, huh, lady? <laughs> They're revisionist historic... Ugh, because it's the fact that we don't we don't have an ideology. We just look at the freaking thing. Okay, I mean, don't have an ideology is the first thing that you have to. We don't have a preformed judgment. I have an ideology. My ideology is you know socialist, anti angles socialism. We don't have a pre I, pre ordained ideology. We just go with what is in front of us. Their revisionist history of. And interesting, interesting how she calls them the revisionist history. Actually, it, the revisionist history is what we've been hearing the whole time. It's what we started with. It's what you started with, Madame Cooper. Their revisionist history of late Fordist social movements points to an incipient fracture between the productive left and even using, continuing to use the left and right is 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 so it. It's obvious why she's just thick in ideology by just sticking to these terms. I mean, I don't even use them as, as much anymore. Every time I say left and right, I have to put quotes on everything. Focused on building and maintaining the economic security afforded by the post-war consensus and what they refer to as the artistic left, more interested in critiquing the predictable securities and norms of Ford's life. If the former can be more or less equated with the trade union movement and old socialist left, the latter consisted of distinctly new components of the left, from feminism and gay liberation to the student movement and counterculture. And all I'm thinking about is that 70s show. Hanging out. <laughs> Having thus distinguished between good labor politics, focused on economic securities and the per permanence of social relations, and a bad sexual politics, focused on liberation from the same set of social relationships, Boltonsky and Chiapalo identify the decline of the family as the most visible sign of neoliberalism's social insecurity. During these years of social regression, they, write, the family became a much more fluid and fragile institution, compounding job insecurity and the general sense of insecurity, the search for maximum flexibility in firms chimed with a depreciation of the family, as a factor of temporal and geographical inflexibility. So that similar ideological schemas are mobilized to justify adaptability in work relationships and mobility and emotional life. Oh, it's so crazy how, like, you know, we can find similar critiques in Frederick Jameson and all these guys, but the problem is we have to use such highfalutin language, you know, to just say that Feminism is neoliberal, okay? That all personal is political is neoliberal. I mean, why can't we just come out and say that? We have to speak in all these highfalutin language because otherwise we won't get published. They control the publishing industry. They control Indigo. They control what books are seen in front of the thing. That's why we have Bill C-11, okay? If, if we had a, a law that said all bookstores have to put a certain book in, in front of their shelf and a certain book in the back of the shelf, which is what B Bill C-11 is, we would call that censorship. But online, that's totally okay. Like Streak, so share this video. Like Streak, Boltonsky, and Chiapalo argue that the artistic left prepared the groundwork for the neoliberal assault on economic and social security by destroying its intimate foundations in the post-war family. Yeah, not just the post-war family. We're talking about community. We're talking about interpersonal relationships. We're talking about friendship. We're talking about the politics of friendship. Read Derrida. By implication, their analysis posits the restoration of the Fordist family or some revision of their as a necessary component of a renewed left 
agenda. By implication, why am I so tired of these platforming straw men? No, nobody's, nobody argued this. This is your implication. This is your insecurity, Cooper. This is your insecurity. Nobody cares about that. Even, I've been polyamorous my whole life. Even in polyamory circles, the hive mind has taken over the possibility of all authentic relationships. Read Eva Alus. It's somewhat surprising that, now here, ah, even Nancy Frazier is on our side. Ha ha. It's somewhat more surprising to find such reflections in the work of Nancy Frazier. Behold. I don't know. I, I, I want to just, it's not surprising. It's, Anybody with integrity, like Nancy Fraser, okay? Anybody with integrity who's not afraid, who isn't motivated by insatiable insecurity, would argue this. Who has done so much to uncover the role of the family wage in shaping the sexual divisions of labor, yet Fraser's long-standing commitment to the conceptual distinction between cultural recognition and economic redistribution places her in a similar bind to Boltonsky and Chapal when it comes to sexual politics of capital. Bitch, even Speedback is on our side. Why? Because these are not, these are the anti-prostitution politics. In her most recent work, Frazier accuses second wave feminism of having colluded with neoliberalism in its efforts to destroy the family wage. Where's my mic? I don't want to drop it because I'm going to break it. If I was rich, I would break my mic right now. Boom. I mean, I already have uh, videos of Nancy Fraser on my Unwitting Colonizers series. Was it mere coincidence that second wave feminism and neoliberalism prospered in tandem? Or was there some perverse subaltern elected affinity between them? Fraser goes on to answer in the affirmative. Our critique of the family wage now supplies a good part of the romance that invests flexible capitalism with a higher meaning and moral point. What she offers as an alternative is a renewed politics of economic security that would allow women and in the long term run men to sustain the families that have been torn apart by enforced flexibility of the neoliberal. Just just look at, you know, I don't know that much about this, but just look at how this plays out in the most non-privileged people. Look at foster care, okay? Look at how children are commodified in foster care, okay? Parentless children. That's a whole video in itself. That's just, the, that's, I can't even begin to talk about it because it's so intense. Obviously, she has no idea about this. Okay. I mean, it's, it's just incredibly sad. Without advocating the simple returns to four, and then we have a whole psychological structure that supports this. The institution of psychology as a whole supports this. That's, that's even bigger than feminism. Okay or as big as feminism, well, same thing. Without advocating the simple return to Fordism that Streak seems to have in mind, Frazier seeks to imagine an improved family wage that would in first instance recognize and valorize women's reproductive labor and perhaps ultimately disrupt the gender division of labor. Yeah, that's the socialist position. We have to give, okay, again, here's the Persian perspective, okay? Cyrus the Great gave uh, women, you know, family leave, okay, 5,000 years ago, okay, look it up, okay, women should get enough money so that they don't go into prostitution, we have to have socialism so that women don't go into prostitution, so that they don't become whatever, 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 reproductive division of labor, whatever, so that they don't complain about emotional labor when you don't bring up, bring enough bacon home, but have, uh, and it, so that you know, if you don't if you don't talk about your emotion or your toxic toxic masculinity if you talk if you talk about your emotions guess what it's too much unpaid emotional labor to give <laughs> to give a shit. But having identified the specific evil of neoliberalism as the destruction of the Fordist family wage, her analysis leads inescapably to the conclusion that resistance demands the restoration of the family, albeit in a more progressive and egalitarian form. Yeah, Frazier has got it right. Either some sort of you know, communal family or, you know, polyamory family or egalitarian family, it's possible. Or, or if you want to get more religious, a com communion, that's the whole freaking thing. We need communion to, f a, a religion of communion to fight the religion of finance capitalism or neoliberalism. Watch my series, read my work, carrying over the burdens of trace. Each of the theory, these theories is clearly indebted to the work of Karl Polanyi, whose thesis of the double movement is pervasive and well 
nigh uncontested in contemporary left formations of anti-capitalist critique. In his signature work, historical The Great Transformation, Polanyi distinguishes Lazen's fair capitalism for all, from all other previous economics exchange by virtue of the fact that it strives to include that was once inalienable within the ambit of exchange value. Now, I'm really interested in how she's going to try to subvert this. Reaching its purest form in 19th century England, Pol Polanyi sees modern capitalism as inhabited by a restless calculative drive that submits even foundational social values such as labor, land, and money to the metrics of commodity exchange. Love. Before we can before we can convince that we have to sell our land, labor, and rivers, that we have to commodify our land and, and rivers and air, we have to be convinced that we have to commodify our emotions and our love. That's before. That's why the left is better at moralizing capitalism than the right is. The right always tried to, the new, the new right, let's say, and the old right. The old right being the pre-Ayn Rand right, the do what you want, do what you can for your community, don't tell me what you can do, the Kennedy line, or community, say, say not what you can do, what is, I'm the worst Kennedy, okay. Under the conditions of modern capitalism, human labor itself loses any intrinsic value and sees its price fixed in, by the highest bidder. Money is subject to the nominal measure of interest and exchange rates. Karl Ratner talks about this. Who are the soldiers of neoliberalism? Prostitutes. Okay, Prosti moralization of prostitutes. And I don't mean actual prostitutes, I mean prostitution logic. Okay, I mean the calculation of all human relationships as a cost-benefit analysis. Thus, essential properties that should be by rights function as foundations and anchors, any st stable system of exchange are said to circulate in the open market as fictitious com communities, commodities. Now, look at what is going on here. You know, if I'm writing a book and I'm going to be doing a literature review of the stuff I disagree with, I'm not going to be undermining it. Having pos posited Aristotle's household economy of measured exchange as ethical reference point, Polanyi can only envisage these innovations as departures from a transcended norm of economic justice. Again, this is a, this is a point of Leo Strauss, where these historical revisionists, right, I'm not talking about Polanyi. I'm just talking about people who engage in historical revisionism don't themselves think of themselves as historical revisionists, A, and B, don't think of themselves as having a transcendent position. Watch my uh, Hegelians versus Spinoza's video. Polanyi understands modern capitalism as the generalization of Aristotle's crematics, an economic regime in which perverse logic of self-multiplying value has overtaken and subsumed the measurement measured reproduction of foundational social values. Of course. As a 20th, and this wasn't just Poland, there's so many people. As a 20th century social democrat, however, he also wants to argue that the disintegrative forces of the free market will inevitably provoke a counter movement bent on protecting the social order. Indeed, the free market itself from the excesses of laissez fair capitalism. And this is where we could, I've always, this that's the Marxist logic. And we can see that Neoliberal capitalism is much more resilient than that. It habituates us. Today, we think that Facebook click, uh, uh, recording our clicks on every screen is you know, surveillance capitalism. Tomorrow, we become okay with it. Tomorrow, we become okay with Neuralink putting it straight into our brain. In a somewhat paradoxical manner, Polanyi imagines the counter-movement as external to the dynamics of capitalism, and yet his... his and yet, historically inevitable and indeed necessitated by the free market itself. That's not paradoxical, that's just Marxist. Reflecting on the history of 19th century industrial capitalism, he observes that the laissez fair utopia of the self regulating market cannot survive in the long run without the intervention of the state of some external form of social protectionism. The state, when, impl when implemented as an economic ideal, the self regulating market, unleashes destructive forces that threatens the very existence of the market system. Pushed to the limit when the in... It, that's why it needs the psychologization, right? Uh, pushed to the limit, the individualizing force excesses of liberal contractualism will generate at some point a social counter-movement intent on protecting workers from the stiff winds of the market. 
But while it must be understood as external to free market capitalism, the counter movement is ultimately necessary to the continued functioning of the market itself, since its role will be to safeguard those essential fictitious communities, money, land, and labor that capital is incapable of protecting of its own accord. This is only a privilege of, again, volunteerism is now only a privilege for the 1% who have gated communities or the, you know, the top 10% who have gated communities. Volunteerism or freedom from the calculation, right, is only for the 5%. At the top, what makes Polanyi's theory of the double movement so appealing to a certain kind of left? Why is she so adamant about keeping this idea of the left? Why? Because it's all she's it's all she's trying to push it into. She's forcing the idea into the into her preconceived notions is her hive mind idioms. It is tendency to conflate capitalism itself with the logic of the free market and thus to reduce its ideological expression to economic liberalism, understood as a force of social disintegration. No, that's just the difference between capitalism and social. That's the difference between capitalism and neoliberalism, okay? Once one has accepted these premises, however, resistance can only be imagined as conservative. Exactly. If capitalism as an ideological formation is reducible to the tenets of economic liberalism, and if market freedom tends to inexorably to disintegrate, disembed, and homogenize social existence through affirmative action, like I just said, then any viable counter movement must seek to re anchor value as a way of arresting these trends. Wonderful. By what? Through religion, okay? Through ritual. By talking about the everyday rituals. This imperative applies not only to the fictitious community of land, labor, and money which the social protectionist movements seek to decommodify and restore, to the, but also to social life more widely, which ultimately demands to be stabilized and re-embedded within the institution of the family. That last part, I'm not sure. We don't, there is no going back. There's no going back, okay? That's just it. There's no going back. That's why we live in a cyberpunk dystopia. If capitalism is theorized as uniquely and exclusively destructive of prior social so solidarities, not prior, now, social sol just all social solidarity, then the counter movement can be imagined only as an effort to restore or at least reinvent that which is, was allegedly destroyed. No, why does she straw man? I keep saying, it. like, it doesn't have, Nancy Frazier just talked about it. It is not by chance that Polanyi evinces an unmistakable nostalgia for the old territorial old order of feudal England where he imagines aristocrats and peasants shared a common attachment to the land family and community they did that's why they were willing to die for it it doesn't not the not necessarily the Polanyi himself was well aware of the potential affinities between his theory of the counter movement and the social conservatives of the right indeed he saw the fascist movements of early 20th century europe as one of the particularly destructive manifestations of the counter movement and one that could be avoided only by implementing the alternative of a socially protectionist and politically de democratic welfare state exactly if if the left doesn't pick up patriotism, the right will pick up nationalism. For Palanye, the difference between a social democratic counter movement and social conservatism of the right was decisive in its historical consequences. And yet it was different of methods and degree, not of kind. These are, these are sophistries. The Palanye social democrat shares conservatives and the I'm not I'm not even Polanyi I don't even care about Polanyi okay it's, he's I don't think I mean he has a great history of the world kind of thing and he's good Marxist but I mean I, there's there's more sophisticated readers that I can read I, I, I didn't read Polanyi to get to the point that to agree with him and, and now okay again people are coming to this agreement from different uh, historical lineages from different academic historical lineages for a reason so look at black male studies at the University of Edinburgh for example the Polanyian social democrat shares the conservatives' nostalgia for community, land, and family, but seeks to transform these institutions into conduits for state-based forms of social protection. Where the Burkean conservative strives to instill family values by force, the social democrat seeks to encourage them through redistribution of social wealth. Yes, that's nice. Polanyi, it might be said, replaces the private family values with the old Elizabethan it might be said, it might be strawmanned, 
that old Elizabethan poor law tradition with the redistribution family values of certain kind of social progressive left. You gotta. This is the kind of straw manning you gotta do to uh, get published these days. In the respect, in his, in this respect, his philosophy of the double movement can be read as the ideal can be read as the ideological expression of the mid twentieth century welfare state, which perfectly combined social democracy and social conservatism in the form of the family wage. What a wonderful straw man! I wish Polanyi could read this. If Polanyi could read this, he would destroy this. <laughs> you know. It's good to attack a dead guy, right? As Polanyi is dead, right? Yeah, I'm pretty sure he's, dead. he's old, right? Anyway, I'm not going to look. This book assumes in instead what Polanyi calls the double movement would be better understood as fully internal to the dynamic of capital. That is to say that economic liberalism and political conservatism, even when the latter speaks the language of anti-capitalist critique, are equally constitutive expressions of modern capitalism. This is like saying that Polanyi is a fascist, I guess. If you want to if you want to do the so you're saying game, you're calling, so you're saying, Polanyi is a fascist? And here's the, here's the key line here. We need not defer to a Hegelian reading. Mm -hmm. We need not defer to a Hegelian reading. You cannot refer to a Hegelian reading, okay? <sighs> Go back to the argument here. The argument is, Engels said that the family is unholy, but before we can say, that the family is unholy. Hey, Engels, were you ever really secular? No, you weren't. We were never really secular. Ask ChatGPT. Is theology embedded in the English language? Ask, go right now, ask. Is theology embedded in the English language? Marxist materialists today that don't understand German idealism don't understand Marxist materialism. Reading of Marx to recognize that this double movement is central to this his depiction of capital's differentiation calculus, differential cap calculus, putting him radically at odds with Polanyi on the question of critique. Most lucidly in the Grundisi, Marx discerns two countervailing tendencies at work in the logic of capitalist valuation. On the one hand, a propensity to deflect all external limits to the speculative generation of social wealth, and on the other hand, a drive to reestablish such limits as the internal condition of value as the internal condition of values realization as private wealth. In more suggestive, less austere mathematical terms, Marx recognized that the capitalist injunction to self-valorization drives beyond national barriers and prejudices as much as beyond nat nature worship, as well as traditional confined complac complacement, encrusted satisfactions of present needs, and reproductions of old ways of life. At the same time that it calls for the reaffirmation of such limits as a way of channeling and restricting the actual realization of wealth. Yet while Marx recognized that the restoration of the fundamental value could be accomplished through any number of institutional and jurisdictional means, from the gold standard to private property in land vagrancy laws limiting the mobility of vo workers, his analysis does not extend to the intimate and reproductive dimensions of this process, which it absolutely did. In its efforts to overcome the all qual quantitative barriers to the generation of wealth, Marx observed capital transgresses all established forms of reproduction, that is, all customary of religious structure, that is, all customary or religious strictures on the organization of gender, all status like constraints on social mobility, and all no national restrictions of circulations of money. But it is not also compelled to reassert the reproduction reproductive institution of race family and nation as a way but is it not also compelled to reassert the reproduction institutions of race family and nation as a way of ensuring the unequal distribution of wealth and income across time isn't it compelled in the last instance to reinstate the family as a the elementary legal form of private wealth of accumulation okay that's why we're having baby machines okay no on this point, Marxist thinking must be radicalized. Okay, we're going to radicalize Marxist thinking. Okay. This assertion of foundation is never merely economic in character since it must ultimately incorporate the social and cultural. No, this can be found in Marx itself. Remember, Marx said everything, what is it? Everything becomes solid, there comes a liquid. It becomes liquidized, as in liquidated. The fire sale. 
conditions under which value is reproduced and reappropriated re re in private form. Kinship, lineage, and inheritance. See, that's kind of weird because I, you can find this in Marx. If the history of modern capital appears on the one hand to regularly undermine the cha challenge and existing orders of gender and sexuality, it also entails the periodic reinvention of the family as an instrument for redistributing wealth and income. Neoliberalism doesn't need the family. Who needs... Who is making this argument are the people that think that the patriarchy still is as is tied to capitalism. Patriarchy is not tied to capitalism. Okay, neoliberalism doesn't need it, the family. Okay, the only people who get family are the top one percent. It's constant apex fallacy. Okay, thus according to Reva Siegel, the legal history of modern family can be understood as a process of preservation through transformation rather than see they only look at the top one percent rather than one of the progressive liberal liberalization where challenges to the established gender and generational hierarchies are repeatedly recaptured with a new more democratic but no less implicable legal structures what eric hobsbawm refers to as the reinvention of tradition can usually be understood as the expression of this double movement provided that we accord no prior stability to tradition as such recognition and recognize the very historicity of the term again recognize all the historicity of everything but then put ourselves in a transcendent position that's a leo strauss argument read or watch my read or watch my video on leo strauss search on my channel leo strauss you have to search on my channel because my youtube is you'll see 11 the very historicity of the term as an invention of 19th century industrial capitalism translating these insights into on into a general reflection of the philosophy of history peter osborne argues that the peculiar tem temporality of modern capitalism is defined by the oscillation of tendencies that are alternative alternatively self-revolutionizing and restorative speculative and radically nostalgic Ugh. For Osborne, both these or orientations may be regarded as temporally integral to political forms of capitalist societies, alternative political articulations of the social form of capitalist accumulation itself. That constant revolutionizing of production, uninterrupted disturbance of the social conditions, everlasting uncertainty and agitation, which Marx and Engels identifies as the distinguishing features of the present epoch nearly 100 years ago. One consequence of his consequence of his analysis is the new neutralization of the Polanyian critique. We cannot hope to counter the logic of capitalist exchange by seeking merely to re-embed or stabilize its volatile signs, since this project is already necessary component of capitalist double movement. She made a straw man. Her straw man was that people like Polanyi and Na uh, Nancy Fraser are arguing for some nostalgic return. They never made that argument. This is insane. You you created a straw man and, you, and then you took it down. Good good for you. They never, Nancy Fraser doesn't want the freaking patriarchal ca family. Nobody wants the patriarchal family. This tension, be it's, a com it's complete farce. I can't believe this is even a thing. The tension between the adapted forces of credit expansion and the appropriate drive to social foundation is constitutive of capital itself. The how neoliberalism creates a social foundation is through the institution of psychology. Again, today we're okay with clicking that Facebook tracks our clicks. Tomorrow we become okay with Neuralink. It's a slow ritualization of social habits, social habituation, Bergman. Although realized in a widely different political forms in different historical movements. That's crazy. She created a straw man. This is a book. Usually, accordingly, this book takes neoliberalism and the new social conservatism as the contemporary expression of capital's double movement. This book is... Oh my god. In doing so, I follow Wendy Brown's seminal essay, American Nightmare, argues that neoliberalism and con neoconservatism must be thought in their co co convergences, collisions, and symbiosis if we are to understand the political rationality of power in the United States today. Okay. Here's the, okay. We're gonna take on that essay then. I'm so I'm so disappointed with academia. Here, I'm even gonna make a note here. So di academia. <laughs>
This thinking together, I would add, is necessary if we are to avoid the trap of mobilizing a left neoliberalism against the regressive social forces of social conservatism or a left social conservatism against the disintegrating effects of the free market. She creates for herself a storm of bullshit. I mean, I can't believe it. She even says Nancy Fraser doesn't make these arguments, but then pins it on Polanyi. I mean, I'm sure like Polanyi made a couple statements about this thinking together I would add is necessary if we were, okay, by neoliberalism, okay, she's gonna define, I refer to the particular American schools of thought in which in the University of Chicago, she's, by neoliberalism, I refer to what everybody else, the hive mind idioms called neoliberalism, which is the University of Chicago, George Mason University and all this crap and various other institutional outposts. The historiography of American neoliberalism is vast. So vast, it covers my own thinking. Here, I, fo I focus on distinct phases in the evolution of new economic liberalism, one that was defined by the social and economic upheavals of the 60s and 70s and the intellectual response that it provoked among free market economists of the Chicago and Virginia schools. During this period, American neoliberals refined and in some cases utterly revised their founding concepts in direct response to the changing gender and racial composition of the workforce. The civil rights and welfare rights movements and the rise of student radicalism. Through the 70s, leading neoliberal intellectuals, Friedman, blah, 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 redefined the intellectual and popular consensus on state deficit spending and the role of the central blank in blank inflation inflation taxation consumer protection okay again the problem here is that we are not understanding that neoliberalism is about the expansion of the state hayek does she even mention hayek there's one mention of hayek okay sorry is hayek here no okay tuition fees at no point in the movement before or after affiliates the chicago and virginia schools as being so directly involved in formulating and implementing government policy. A figure such as Milton Friedman, for instance, was remarkable, remarkably involved in policy decisions of Nixon, Carter, and Reagan ad administrations. At various movement moments, he could be found lending his hand to proposals and blah, 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 blah. We already know this story. By new social conservatism, I refer to the spectrum of conservative movements that emerged after the 60s, often in response to the same set of concerns that mobilized neoliberals into action. Under this term, I can include neoconservative movement as such, which in its earliest incarnation was almost exclusively pre preoccupied with domestic social issues. The new religious right comprising of Catholics and evangelicals, new paternalism of Lawrence Mead, and the communitarian movement in social welfare. What? And the communitarian movement in social welfare. That is really interesting why she includes that as neoconservative. This is neoconservative? Although others use the term neoconservative to refer to a broad coalition of conservative currents, I prefer to use the term new social conservatism because I want to make up my own bullshit so as to address the specificity of the actual neoconservatives within this coalition. So she wants to basically point out Polanyi and Nancy Fraser as being in that category? This is amazing. The new, in new social conservatisms, so she serves to distinguish these very, she made a straw man and she's just sticking to it. Is she gonna stick to the straw man to the whole book? The new, in new social conservatism serves to distinguish these various currents from the traditionalist or Burkean conservatism of the American paleoconservatives, whose anti-statism, anti-Semitism, and aversion to racial democracy made them ill-suited to any compromise with the New Deal left. Okay, poor, Ber poor Berkeley. I mean, Berkeley had a, such a sophisticated idea. He's lumped in with all these guys. Many, if not all, most of the new generation of social conservatives, in fact, had traveled some great part of the way with the political left and were opposed to the great society expansion of the New Deal. Not the New Deal experiment itself. The representatives of these movements came from diverse political backgrounds. A small handful of them had been fellow, fellow travelers of right-wing figures such as Barry Goldwater, William F. Buckley. This is a crazy historical revisionism happening right now. Figures in the Cold War Conservative Libertarian Alliance. Others had emerged out of the more fundamentalist, traditionally quietist, 
currents within the American Protestantism. The so cr Christians that believe in socialism, many more came from the political left. Uh-oh. Most of the first generation of neoconservatives were former Trotskyists, Cold War Democrats who had remained fiercely committed to the New Deal welfare and its conservative sexual order. Look at look at how so if you look up the hashtag manarchism, that is a really good way of noticing how what Gabriel Rockhill is correct at what I said before is that we don't need a panopticon to socially regulate. We need these people to socially regulate. These are the, the absolute Karens of the, of the neoliberal left. These are the Karens of the neoliberal left. Although the more prominent among them, Irving Kristol and his son Bill Kristol, it's so cra crazy, most notably would later join forces with the Republicans, others remain firmly attached to the Democratic Party. The communitarians who succeeded them on the political stage after the 1980s were closely aligned with Bill Clinton. Do I really have to talk about Epstein right now and how Me Too didn't focus on Epstein at all when it should have had? Instead, we're focusing on Aziz Ansari's bad date or, or Louis C.K. politely asking people to jerk off in front of. It should have been about Epstein. For his part, the new paternalist, Lawrence Mead, never identified with any part party in particular. Throughout this period, in 1996, only white religious conservatives have remained overwhelmingly associated with the political right. During the 70s, American neoliberalism and the new social conservatism matured and came together in response to the same set of events. What a lie. Okay, let's see what she says. It is almost always assumed that neoliberal so new social conservative alliance was forged in response to Keynesianism itself. It's because, as exemplified in the New Deal welfare state and radicalized by Johnson's Great Society. But this is to misunderstand the specificity of their critique. Emphate emphatically, what prompted their reaction was not the New Deal welfare state itself, although neoliberals certainly had a long tradition of critique on this front. Wait, then she even... Her, the, I mean, instead of like just... Focusing on the very qualifications she gives, she focuses, she gives the qualification. She says Nancy Fraser doesn't believe this, but here's what I think the implications are anyway. She does, says Polanyi may not use this as an analogy, but I'm going to go all the way with it. She does it again. Although neoliberal certainly had a, that's enough of a qualification, but rather the panoply of liberation movements that emerged out of and in excess of the post-war Keynesian order towards the end of the 60s. At various movements between the 60s and 80s, poverty activists, well-failed militants, feminists, AIDS activists, and public interest lawyers articulated a novel politics of redistribution that delinked risk protection from sexual division of labor and social insurance from sexual normativity. These movements were historically unique in that they continued to fight for greater wealth and income redistribution while refusing the normative con constraints of the formatist family wage. While neoliberals and neoconservatives were surprisingly sympathetic to efforts to democratize the New Deal welfare state, most notably when it came to the inclusion of African American men within the family wage system, again, now look at how she points her finger. They balked when the Fordist family itself came into question. Again, the Fordist family is dead. We're in 2023. Who cares? In short, it was only when the liberation movement of the 60s began to challenge the sexual normativity of the family wage. Again, I'm going to rephrase this. It was only when AI, okay, <laughs> that we see this book. It's only when AI actually attacks, I already said that point already, as the linchpin foundation of welfare capitalism that the new liberal neo-social conservative alliance came into being. What they proposed in response to the crisis was not a return of the Fordist family wage, the particular nostalgia would have been the hallmark of the left, but rather the strategic reinvention of a much older poor law tradition of private family responsibility using the combined instruments of welfare reform, changes to taxation and monetary policy. This is something that's only in the top 1%, lady. Under the influence of welfare, under their influence, welfare has been transformed from a redistributive program into an immense federal apparatus for policing the private family responsibilities of the poor, while deficit spending has been steadily transferred from the state to the private family. Though policy... Why does she say private family? There are no... Through, through poli policies designed to democratize credit markets and inflate asset values, 
These reformers had sought to revise the tradition of private family responsibility in the idiom of household debt, while simultaneously accommodating and neutralizing the most ambitious political desires of the 60s. Despite its prominence and political rhetoric of the Reagan revolution and beyond, who cares about Reagan anymore? Reagan, again, watch that video. Reagan sold American democracy to Iranian terrorists. Most academic accounts of this era see the politics of family values as peripheral to structural economic battles waged over, for example, monetary policy, state benefits, state deficit spending, or the redistribution of wealth through taxation. Reagan is said to have deployed family values rhetoric to cover for his macroeconomic policies and to reduce the working class into alliances that would ultimately work against them. The neoconservative cultural wars are understood in re retrospect as a useful distraction from the real business of cutting funding uh, to public education and the arts, while Clinton's communitarianism is similarly understood as a ruse to design to soften the edges of his neoliberal economic policy and a useful instrument for healing the historical breach between old and new Democrats. Yeah, typically emanating from the left, these accounts tend to dismiss the florid defense of family values as so much flotsam and jetsam floating above the real story of monumental wealth redistribution and class warfare. I know what this is about, Melinda. Something to do with your with your own historical with your own personal trauma. Okay, this is something to do with your own personal trauma, lady. The idea that economic process can and should be separated from the merely this is the problem with high mind psychology. It actually makes it so that we're unable to actually talk about psychology. The idea of economic process can and should be separated from the merely cultural phenomenon of gender, race, and sexuality as a long intellectual pedigree expressed variously in Marxist vocabulary of base and superstructure. The vernacular distinction between identity and class politics and late Frankfurt School language of recognition versus redistribution. Although all perhaps ultimately indebted to, indebted to the contract versus status opposition deployed by 19th century anthropologists such as Henry Summer Maine. As a methodological and political point of departure, each distinct, such distinctions have always been suspect. The 19th century anthropological language of status and contract, for example, served to obscure and sentimentalize the existence of women's unpaid labor in the home as precisely the historical movement when the boundaries between labor market and the private family were being established. We also sentimentalize the idea of dying for your family. Why? Because it's, it is sentimental, okay? Now it's a psychological problem. Women were thus relegated to the quasi-sacred space of kinship and the gift relation at a time when they were being actively excluded from the contractual labor market by an alliance of trade unionists and conservative protectionists. In general, leftist demands for the decommodification. That's the story they want to tell. In general, leftist demands for the decommodification of social life or the pr protection of kinship relationships all too readily lend themselves to the social conservative argument that certain forms of domestic feminized labor should remain unpaid. This is why prostitution politics will win, right? This is why this is why we live in a cyberpunk dystopia because they have the moral arguments. The distinction between recognition and redistribution performs a similar kind of revisionist work today, obscuring the actual histories of intricacies, the actual histories made by um, the made by academia, <sighs> intricacies of his economic and sexual politics, while actively quarantining the family from critique. The family would, would have been the site of the original socialism. We need only look at the historical example of Ford's family wage to see that the redistribution and recognition cannot be understood in isolation. As an instrument of redistribution, the standard Ford's wage actively policed the boundaries between women and men's work and white and black men's labor. And in its social insurance dimensions, it was inseparable from the imperative of social sexual normativity. Go just for a second, go search Twitter employees before and after Elon Musk and just laugh at this. The Fordist political politics of class was itself a form of identity politics in as much as established white married masculinity, blah, 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 blah. 
Yeah. Okay. Fucked obfuscation. Pure obfuscation. Today, the what I love about this book is just it lays out clearly the, the full obfuscation that's going on. Today, the politics of redistribution is no longer channeled through the instrument of the Fordless family wage. Yeah, because it died 50 years ago and you keep talking about it. Okay, so let's sit, let's talk about it then. It is much more heavily influenced by the wealth transmitting mechanism of private inheritance, inheritance than it was in the post-war era. We're talking about the top 1%. The only people that these people can even imagine. They only look up. But here again, this whereas I'm trying to look down as a fifth estate person, I call myself, as a villager person, I look towards hearing, listening to the subaltern, people who are less privileged than me. These people can only see up. What was it? Knowledge equals power and power equals responsibility. That's what I used to teach in class. Now I teach it's too much emotional, unpaid emotional labor <laughs> to give a shit. But here again, the distinction between recognition and redistribution proves unhelpful as a way of understanding the actual imbrications of sexual and imbrications of sexual and economic politics. How after are we so separate the wealth? How after all are we so are we to separate the wealth distributive work of inheritance from the legal and cultural legitimation of the family? In what sense can the regulation of sexuality be abstracted? from a legal instrument of wealth appropriation that takes the form of family genealogy. Ooh, doo -doo -doo. This is the point, right? The point is to go after inheritance, right? That's the next part of the neoliberal capitalist. Or that's what I'm, that's what I'm seeing is to go after inheritance, which would be good if we live in an actual socialist state force monolithic ideology through affirmative action. That's what the goal here is. This book proceeds from the assumption that the history of economic foundations, formations, cannot be prized apart from the operations of gender, race, and sexuality without observ- This book must repeat the hive mind idioms in order to get published by revisiting and questioning established historical accounts of the stagflation crisis in the 70s, I seek to show that the question of the family was as central to the formation of post-Keynesian capitalist order as it was to the welfare state capitalism. And therefore, it cannot be ignored without profoundly misinterpreting the political history of the... Why don't you talk about now then? I mean, where is your trajectory? What about now? There is no family now. What are you talking about? So right now, unlike many on the left, the key actors of the new neoliberal, new social or conservative alliance had no hesitation in recognizing the family as the locus of crisis. These actors were in doubt that the grand macroeconomic issues of the time, from inflation to budget deficits to ballooning welfare budgets, ref reflected an ominous, ominous shift in sexual and racial foundations of the Fordist family. Given this assessment, they could see only one possible solution the wholesale reinvention of the family itself. This book will be dedicated to the project, project of exploring how the process of reinvention was conceived. If it was re reinvented, where is it now? And how it eventually overtook the intellectual ambitions of its authors. So the historical revisionism is happening now is about the family wage. Historical wor works I have read on American capitalism in the 20th century. It's been incredibly helpful for me. Absolutely tremendous. An intellectual history that is genuinely groundbreaking. This is insane. Complete banger. She started with she started with a straw man. Then she upheld a straw man. This is why I've created the hashtag platform straw man culture. I don't know. This is crazy. Uh, a complicated convincing narrative based on queer and feminist readings of history that weaves together several intellectual fields. Cooper explores the manner in which neoliberalism the influential intellect intellectual school of thought, not, all, not the mindless slur hurled by Chapo Red Square crowd, and social conservatism fed into one another and shaped public policy over the last 20th and 21st century. The conservatives just came out and destroyed the affirmative action, okay? It's really crazy how much traction this book has gotten in such a short amount of time which is another angle of my other hashtag called Hive Mind Idioms, okay? Manages to convey the intellectual history of Quinn Slobodian globalist economic history, Polanyi, The Great Transformation, Kenneth Jackson's 
crab grass frontier. Okay, ongoing, ongoing. Cooper makes a really fascinating connection between the libertarian obsession with freedom of contract and its dependence upon deeply racialized and heteronormative family structures. It's not a fascinating connection. This is this is just the best, the most Iron Man version of a, a straw man that I could think of. It's really, really insane. This is easily one of the most fascinating books I have ever read. One, something you, you're surprised you didn't know. You didn't know this? Hey, they're, they, something you'd rather not know, something... <laughs> <laughs> okay, just just to be just to say one more thing was that Melinda Cooper herself talks about how various strands come to the same conclusion without knowing each other. Okay, I'm not influenced by Crystal, the neoconservatives, Billy Crystal and his son, or whatever. I'm not influenced by those people. Okay, but still, we have come to the same conclusions. It's not because these various strands come from uh, different, it's not because these various strands that came from different, so she tries to basically tie together all these strands and say it's from one situation, okay? We're gonna keep reading, it's really crazy. It's so insane. There's no one star rating, except, <laughs> okay, let's keep going. This is a really unique, this is, this is a really unique, unique, it's not unique at all take on contemporary cultural politics and macro macroeconomics it's basically the hive mind what the hive mind is trying to enforce okay locates the conservative role for the nuclear family as the key ideological plank of both neoliberal political economy and new social conservatism wow she argues that the belief in the family as a moral and economic unit underpins both philosophies the new social conservatism obsession with family values is more obvious. The pro-fatherhood, -fa anti-gay, anti-permissive. Dude, this is a guy <laughs> who's married. I thought I knew a lot about neoliberalism, but family values transformed my understanding of it as an ideology and a political program. Each chapter covers a different aspect of social policy, welfare, health insurance, education, but one theme connects them all. It's a deep complementary between neoliberal concerns and about moral hazard, lax governmental policies creating incentives for risky per per perverse behavior, and a desire for social conservatives to restore the authority of traditional institutions like the family and the church. Libertarian rhetoric about the market expanding the sphere of individual freedom to pursue a wide range of lifestyles definitely rings. So you can see there's some, there's some contra, there's some, Oh my goodness. I'm just I'm just surprised that there's just so many people that are repeating the bullshit. Actually, am I surprised? Not really. This is just <laughs> this is the pro this is the amount this is the amount of how neoliberal subjectivity has has so deeply ingrained the university structure that all these people are repeating the line and i'm here to get you out of the neoliberal subjectivity everybody chapter two the moral crisis of inflation neoliberalism neoconservatism and the demise of the family wage during every great inflation there is a striking decline in both public and private morality in 79 the incoming chairman of the federal reserve volcker initiated a new era of american political life by taking decisive action on inflation after years of increasingly polarized debate volcker de Deployed the technocratic instrument of covert interest rate adjustment and the ideological cover of monetarism to plunge the American economy into its deepest period of recession since the Great Depression, thereby ending a long drawn out process of spiraling inflation. Does she talk about the petrodollar? Just petrochemical, so there's no petrodollar. At this turning point, it was at this turning point that neoliberalism and neoconservatism and their derivatives, this is a pure obfuscation that's happening here. This, is, this itself is a neoliberal obfuscation that is happening here emerged as a fully fledged social philosophies and dominant forces on the political stage. But it was preceding decade in response to the combined problems of inflation and rising unemployment that neoliberals and neoconservatives first elaborated and perfected their signature critique of great society welfare state. If we are to understand how a discourse of crisis was born, 
and how neoliberalism and neoconservatives leverage this discourse to redefine the terms of political power over the following years, it is imperative that we revisit the debates of this period and question the established historical accounts for their resolution. So before we go further, let's discuss what I mean by neoliberal obfuscation. Neoliberalism purports that it would decrease the size of the state, just like how Reagan in voice said that it's all about libertarianism, tr free trade, deregulation, uh, inviting foreign competition, um, privatization, all of these good things for libertarians. But in fact, what really happens? For instance, the privatization of state-owned companies can reduce the state involvement of in sectors like what I mean is that as we see what's going on in Honduras as an example, what's happening in Honduras? All these neoliberals are going there and you know starting a bit, bit Bitcoin haven, but what they need is the government to actually enforce neoliberalism is needed needs the government to sup to intervene in so many of our areas. It needs the government to intervene in so many of our areas to enforce neoliberal subjectivity, enforce property rights, to enforce copyright, to enforce uh, uh, all of these things, and it to ensure a stable economic and macroeconomic environment. The reason why neoliberalism needs okay a global order of the petrodollar, okay, it needs to have so the the relationship between the size of government and neoliberalism isn't necessarily straightforward okay because what neoliberalism is trying to do is have a global world order and to have a form of benign control where we all go and we think we are free right but in really we are enslaved so while perhaps in some sense the government is shrinking in a very real sense, and from a from a macro perspective, from a stepping up perspective, the governmentality, that's what it is, governmentality, biopolitics has increased, right? This is what is justifying biopolitics. It justifies all these pandemic kinds of things uh, that it does. The principle is not to reduce the size of government at all, but rather to limit the government's intervening in economic affairs and to create economic affairs even between family relationships, to have a cost-benefit analysis in our friendship relationships, to have... Why, did it, why does the neoliberalism need to do that? Neoliberalism needs to do that because, again, we started with this idea of surplus emotional labor. It, it creates a much higher surplus when we all have a relationship of economic benefit to one, one another. When we all are doing cost-benefit analysis, we all lose individually, we all lose collectively in a way, but the 1%, the ones who are already at the start of the capitalist system, the ones who started the economic capitalist system, the ones who started the pyramid scheme, they get, the ones who get to print the money and get the most amount of value from the printed money, while the rest of us, as the money circulates, each time a money circulates in the economy after it's been printed, it gets less and less value. In fact, most of the world's economy is in finance today. It's just financial gains today, right? They have, so why, why are we experiencing all of this kind of uh, austerity? Not just a kind of, governmental austerity, but actually a social austerity. Why are we experiencing a social austerity, a lack of volunteerism towards one another is because neoliberal subjectivity, okay? Because of neoliberal subjectivity, which seeks to extract from us as a whole by making us all productive, self-productive by ourselves. This need to tie neoliberalism to the family is a really beautiful neoliberal obfuscation that we are looking at here. But we're going to continue to look at it because I think it's exemplative of what's happening in academia today. And I showed you the list of five-star reviews on 
Goodreads because I wanted to show also how academia is just gone. You know, th that's the only solution to this. We just have to forget about academia altogether. Start doing your own research, just like how the 1% in Bruno Latour's work have basically left us out to dry, right? And now we see the conservatives are fighting back, trying to take what they can out of the system before it, uh, before it crashes or before it becomes extremely difficult to live. Everybody now is trying to get what they can out of the system. The white man's burden has become too burdensome for the white man in itself. So it's widely believed that Lyndon Johnson precipitated the onset of inflation in the 60s by refusing to cut back on military expenditures while he initiated an ambitious new program of health, welfare, education, spending, and the agus of the great society. Why is it that we, that Melinda Cooper does such a hard work of strawmanning people like Polanyi and Nancy Fraser? while Iron Manning the greatly believed expressions. She Iron Mans the, the greatly believed ex expressions and then, you know, takes on the Iron Man perspectives while straw manning people who are really leftists. Historically, periods of inflation have routinely followed the exceptional military expenditures of wartime. Johnson's launched a disastrous new war in Vietnam while at the same time pursuing an expansionary domestic politics at home. This is because uh, of Bretton Woods, right? This is because of the whole Bretton Woods system becoming, this is the rise of the petrodollar. We had to, as um, you know, we or the West, uh, America had to make sure that it had the greatest economy military because that military is going to be tied to the petrodollar. Inflation also reflected a shift in the old balance of powers between former colonial states and the metropolitan centers. American military venture in Vietnam came at a time when many former colonies were gaining independence and were able to demand higher prices for their export commodities. The thing is, none of this stuff really matters because as long as they're trading in American dollars, that's all that matters. As long as their trade is in American dollars, that's neoliberalism. That's, these are neoliberal ideas, right? It doesn't matter how much the thing is. It the matter is that they are trading in American dollars. A shift that ultimately fed into the price of all consumer commodities from food to oil. By the mid seventies, America was importing a third of its oil from foreign sources. Why? It's the petrodollar. She never even mentions the word petrodollar as compared to one fifth in the 60s. This left the entire productive and consumer economy vulnerable to the oil embargoes imposed by OPEC in 73 and 79. These then, okay, that's, that was the problem, right? Because the neoliberal system depends on the petrodollar. That became a problem. So that's why they overthrew the Iranian Shah. These then were the key factors contributing to the economic phenomenon of consumer price inflation. How and why inflation, it didn't matter because the 1% who were making these laws long ago, since at least Reagan, right, realized that they don't have to be tied to the American taxation system at all. Right? They can do whatever they want. They can have Panama Canal, Panama offshore accounts and have Epstein relationships. How and why inflation became a political crisis is less clear. Today, many... How and why inflation became a political crisis is less clear. Today, many if not most accounts of economic predicament in the 70s subscribe to the idea that inflation represented an unmitigating crisis for all social classes, a narrative except the 1%, a narrative that has hardened into orthodoxy in the wake of Reagan revolution in which itself represents the triumph of a certain kind of revisionist analysis. Look at how she points her finger to other people doing revisionism. That's really interesting. The historian Iwin Morgan contends in the 70s, and she's going against a lot of academics here, so I'm not alone, represented the most miserable period for the US economy since the Great Depression in the 30s, bringing an end to the perpetual increase in living standards that had marked the post-war era. And this is all because of Bretton Woods. Drawing on the work of the neoconservative Daniel Bell, the economic sociologist Greta Krippner attributes the bitter distributional struggles of the 70s to increasing severe limits in the nation's prosperity, 
without asking how and where wealth was being redistributed and how a market trend towards downward redistribution might have precipitated a neoconservative discourse around the limits of growth in the first place. To reiterate, Bruno Latour talks about how we, how the 1% had a, showed its hand when it came out of the Paris Accord and all these Bezos and all these guys aren't tied to the system of taxation that we are all tied to. They can, you know, when Hillary Clinton said, this man doesn't pay his taxes, and Trump said, that makes me smart. <laughs> That's been a long-term game. That's been a long-time game. Tax avoidance. Only the 1% can really avoid the tax av avoidance in the, to the extreme. They already abandoned us in 2008 financial crisis. They abandoned us many years ago, probably 60 years ago since the Reagan administration even. Even the archetype of all this stuff, the Reagan administration, they realized, might have been something racially motivated perhaps, the 1% realized that America is gone. There's nothing to, <laughs> there's nothing to save here. And they took their money out of the system a long time ago and floating in financial markets around the world. We don't, we cannot account for 40% of the world global economy. This is beyond all this stuff. This is beyond all the ability of being analyzed by the academics. More than the one contemporary observer of these economic trends acknowledged that the redistributed conserve consequences of inflation were far from transparent. Economist Edward Wolf, who has conducted a study investigating the effects of inflation on household wealth between 69 and 74, went so far to argue that inflation acted like a progressive tax, leading to a, a greater equality in the distribution of wealth. Exactly. Inflation. So here she's arguing, she's going to be arguing something different than me, but this is good. That's what I'm saying. That's what the power of the petrodollar does. Inflation acts like a progressive tax. The force of trade unionism at the time, so I don't know if it's a progressive tax, but just a tax on everybody. A tax on every, all the people in the tax farm, unless you can avoid the tax farm altogether. The force of trade unionism at the, at the time was that wage, wages continued to rise alongside the consumer price index, with the consequence that inflation actively benefited those who depended on wages for their income not on interests and dividends from the financial assets. Inflation actively benefited those who depended on wages for their income, not on interests and dividends from their financial assets. This is, again, this is a war between all the people within the tax farm. The Brookings Institution economist Joseph Minark found that the benefits were particularly clear for middle-class homeowners, but even the lowest income groups were not as vulnerable as rising prices as was generally assumed since the most social insurance programs were indexed to the consumer price index. So if you have a home, you're going to do okay. That's the idea. Inflation, moreover, had the curious effect of redistributing wealth from creditors to debtors by steadily eroding the price of debt. As long as... So what happened then? What happened then is that America itself became the biggest debtor, right? It became so in debt. It were more than, you know, a trillion dollars in debt or whatever. It became an asset in a way. As long as wages kept rising, it made sense for workers to buy the future on credit, giving rise to the popular perception that everyday workers were turning into investors and speculators, indulging in luxury consumer goods that had only been recently out of their reach. They did become investors and speculators. What do you think the GME, the, the GameSpot, debacle was right GameSpot debacle was all these people realizing realizing that the financial <laughs> system was rigged so if we all you know put our money in GameSpot, <laughs> that was a crazy time whose net worth derived from financial assets however the consequences of inflation were remittingly negative now this is not the one percent this is the this is the top class this is the second tier so let's make a distinction here during the french revolution we had the three estates the fourth estate would be for, for perhaps the proletariat the third estate would be the bourgeoisie we're talking about the new second estate these are the financial guys 
that aren't able to become really the one percent you know they're the they're the two to nine percent or the three to nine percent let's say then there's the bourgeoisie the people who own some things and then there's the proletariat the fourth estate which is usually conflated with the media but then we can also look at the fifth estate the people who are the villagers the people who are not productive in the economy at all this is why neoliberal colonialism need to grow endless grow it needs to go into the mountains of tibet and enforce un ideas of pro protestant ethics all over the world why because protestant ethics are conducive to penetrated by neoliberal capitalism everywhere that capitalism goes the first task is to destroy the traditional societies whether that be patriarchy whether that be whatever in order to allow them to be penetrated by neoliberal capitalism so again this is not the war between one percent and the proletariat this is the war between the five percent or whatever the third estate fourth fifth estate okay well, now they're the let's say the second estate and the third and fourth estate the second estate the new second estate here being the financial people the consequences of inflation were unremittingly negative institutional and pers personal investors including the wealthiest 10 percent of households searched in vain for a safe avenue of investment throughout this period as inflation eroded the realist, real rates of return on their long-term financial aspect assets so this is not and we're gonna and this is not okay this is not the one percent again this is not the globalists okay this is the conservatives the people who own houses the longest investors the second longest investors in the global capitalist order uncertainty however hovered over the future of investments for rich and poor alike so this is what she's responding to uncertainty uh but whereas the unpredictability of the dollar's future price promised depreciating at interest payments to everyday workers and debtors it signified the exact opposite to the nation's creditors and ever diminishing asset values and the futility of investment itself this is in banks okay this is in banks this is why you know in other countries in the world you put your money in a bank it goes up actually here i mean <laughs> it doesn't do anything by the late 70s the situation prompted a sensibility of outright anti-government rebellion among free market neoliberals such as rose and milton friedman who ac accused the federal government of defrauding investors of their wealth via the manipulation of the money supply of course money supply was being manipulated there was no gold standard anymore milton friedman perhaps this is where libertarianism and neoliberalism need to be distinguished milton friedman perhaps be more on board or hayek at least would more on board with the gold standard right hayek at the end of his life realized that if you can read early hayek and late hayek hayek at the end of his life realize that what happens when you subject the money itself if you take out the monopolistic aspect of money itself okay if you allow money itself to be part of the competitive system that's what's happening with all these coins electronic coins what happens is that there's no system to keep it all intact anymore so you need the state neoliberalism needs the state in order to manipulate the money supply whereas the old lib libertarian the old classical liberal perspective is one that says no the money needs to be representative of something it has to represent i mean you can still kind of make that argument anyway for the investment class this is not really the investment class these are the passive investors that put their money in uh, banks and uh, expect the banks to do their investment for them yeah. The sense of crisis was exasperated by the fact that labor unions in the 70s were able to hold their own against any attempt to push down wages in response to inflation. Business owners lamented the fact that rising costs of production could not be offset by a corresponding rise in labor productivity as they encountered an ever more militant and restrictive workforce. It was similarly impossible for American corporations to recoup losses by pushing up prices because they were now confronted with rising competitive pressures from Europe and Japan. The growing political influence of organized labor was reflected in the fact that wages continue to rise against the background of high unemployment. Again, this is another perspective. The unions 
have never gave a shit about migrant workers. Unions have never given a shit about the people who are not, who the workers who are not in the union, or they, they started to give a less and less of a shit every time, okay? The people, so this is what happens with all the, you know, Mexicans who come up and work in America for cheap. Because do labor unions, did, did labor unions ever care about them, the real, let's say the, not the real pro proletariat, but let's say the fifth estate? See, Marx, all these guys, it's the people, the villager people, the people who are not productive, are not included, the subaltern. This phenomenon known as stagflation confounded the predictions of post-war Keynesian economics, which in the form of the so-called Phillips curve posited, posited a stable negative relationship between the level of unemployment and the rate of change of wages. So we're not talking about the 1% here. The 1% being the new first estate, let's say. We're talking about the war between the second estate, the third estate, and the fourth estate. The proletariats, the bourgeoisie, and the finance capital. Okay, We're not talking about the people who are just outside of the productive system altogether. We're the first to be colonized after this tightening that's been happening in the last couple of years since 2008. For the business and investment class, stagflation was a sign that Keynesian consensus between labor and capital had outlived its political use usefulness. So again, we're talking about the wars between, basically the people, we're talking about the wars between people within the system. The wars between, so this is like, the, the closest thing I can think of is, think of what's happening in France, right? All these people are, are marching in the streets, yeah, vive la France and all this stuff. Yeah, I would be there too. But their ability to march in the streets is predicated on the enslavement of Mali and the rest of cent Central Africa or wh wherever France has their extraction. Do you understand what I'm saying? People don't, don't even think about the people outside of the productive system. Simply put, and this is what the problem with all leftist thinking today. Simply put, so I come at it from a villager's perspective. Simply put, what had looked like a consensus solution to all parties in the wake of the Great Depression now appeared to be empowering the working class over investors. Today, a number of, so that's not, that's still, that can still be neoliberalism, okay? Healthcare, the healthcare that we have now, all right, doesn't give people proper nutrition, doesn't give people holistic, okay? Healthcare is a last second solution when you haven't been taking care of your body. You've been eating McDonald's for 20 years and then you go to the doctor and say, doctor, doctor, this doesn't work. And the doctor's like, okay, here, take this pharmaceutical pill. That's the healthcare that we have. That's neoliberal healthcare. It's giving antibiotics to the tax farm. Today, a number of scholars argue that Volcker shock of the 79 must be understood as a concerted political response to the rising militancy of the Fordist working class. Look at how there's just uh, this interclass conflict for this working class. In their illuminating analysis of this period, the political economist Kenneth Grindon Dickens remind us that Arthur Burns, chairman of the Federal Reserve between 70 and 78, openly ascribed the problem of stagflation to the overweening power of trade unions and the social welfare expenditures that, in this view, serve to subsidize strikes. These theorists perform the important task of restoring the question of class politics to the historiography of inflation. Yet they are less successful in accounting for the peculiar focus and moralizing tenor of attacks on social welfare during this period. Again, you don't you don't ha have to talk about welfare is how you get people tied to the system as well. Okay, welfare is how you get people tied to the neoliberal system as well. You get people tied to it. People can't escape it. Having assumed an already unified, I'm not against uh, welfare or socialism. I'm just saying that the type of welfare that we get under a neoliberal system isn't one that is there to help your prosperity. The kind of healthcare that we get in Canada or wherever is a last minute healthcare, you know? It's getting people addicted to psychiatric pills. And this is part of the anti-psychology videos I'm making. 
psychiatry. Having assumed an already unified conception of the working class, they cannot tell us why contemporary diet. So having assumed an already unified conception of the working class. I mean, why don't you apply these kinds of critical analysis to your own, to your own assumptions at the beginning of the book? They cannot tell us why the contemporary diagnosis of crisis focused on insistently on one, on one welfare program in particular, AFDC, Aid to Families with Dependent Children, and why program came to be associated with a general crisis of the American family. Conse there is a culture war. I'm not saying there isn't a culture war. I'm just saying it's the 1% are not included and the villagers are not included in this analysis. Consequently, they are unable to explain how problematic problematic of family dysfunction became so central to popular understandings of inflation or why the Reagan era response to inflation would propel family values to the forefront of American politics over the next several decades. Well, that's because we've already known for a long time that capitalism must do something or rather cap capitalism needs a way of having people be spiritually invested in the system. And what better way to do that than the family? We have to spiritually be invested in the system. So before, uh, now we are spiritually invested in the system in a completely neoliberal subjectivity way, okay? Now we are invested in a, the system in a completely new way. This is in the past when we needed something. We need to be working for something, right? So family values, that's what we can... That's what we can, that's what was available at the time, was family values. Now, what are we, what are we invested in the system for? Now, people are invested because of neoliberal subjectivity. I need to, all the stuff, all the videos that you see on YouTube, all the, all the Instagram feed, uh, pop psychology you hear is part of the new system of theology of capitalism. This is the old system of theology of capitalism, where again, I can't just work for no reason. I need a theological, I need a spiritual reason to do it. And the Protestant work ethic, why not? That's what it was out of, okay? So she says, why the Reagan response to inflation would propel family values to the forefront of American politics. Because when you're squeezing more out of the people, you need something to spiritually invigorate them with. What else other than family values? For contemporary commentators, however, the stakes were clear enough. Stagflation was a problem not only because it skewed the Fordist social consensus in favor of the working class, but also because it threatened to undermine the normative foundations of the Fordist family wage. So this is basically the 1% getting the 3% to 9% or 10% to fight, okay, I'm gonna say, this is the first estate getting the second, third, and fourth estate to fight each other. For contemporary commentators, however, the stakes were clear enough. Stagflation was a problem not only because of, okay. In effect, in the 70s, commentators from across the political spectrum agreed that inflation represented a threat to the moral fabric of American society. With a nod to Hayek, Volcker described inflation as a moral issue. This is such a straw man here. Hayek's idea was it corrodes trust, particularly trust in government. Hayek was wrote the book, The Road to Serfdom. What was that all about? The Road to Serfdom was all about the same kinds of ideas that we are hearing, the moralizing of capitalism that we hear from the left. I might cut out uh, another video I did right here and make that argument. It corrodes trust, particularly trust in government. It is the governmental responsibility to maintain the value of currency that they issue. When they fail to do so, that is something that undermines the essential trust in government. It doesn't matter about trust in government. This isn't, sure, it's an, I don't know why it's a nod to Hayek. Volcker could have been talking about whatever he wanted to talk about. Volcker, I mean, Hayek says, I'm gonna cut, cut that video. Others traced a direct line of causation between the erosion of political trust and the breakdown of traditional family. Now, others, she's piecing together a narrative. It wasn't Hayek. Hayek never said that. The monetarist Friedman understood inflation as a dangerous distortion of money that undermined the intrinsic neutrality and imposed a fraudulent tax on investors. Friedman, 
Infl for Friedman, inflation was foremost a consequence of excessive growth in the money supply. Okay, where the, so family structures, okay? And yet the money supply had also become entangled with fiscal policy when the government paid for indulgent self social welfare programs by monetizing debt rather than the raising taxes of borrowing funds. Inflation then was not only an evil in itself, it also served to finance welfare programs whose major evil was to undermine the fabric of society, that is, the natural incentives of the family and the market. What grounds property rights? What grounds property rights? That's what the... See, the problem is we have to take each... She's, she's melding together all these people, but they all have completely different perspectives. Like, even Friedman and Hayek are different, right? Friedman is like a Lockean, right? He needs to and and Hayek is not really a Lockean uh, he's much more advanced in his neoliberalism I guess the Virginia school public school choice economists James Buchanan and Richard Wagner discern an even more direct relationship between inflation and moral crisis unlike the mon monetarist Friedman so you see how she's melding something together. The Virginia school economists expounded a fiscal theory of inflation that pointed to government deficits as a primary cause of monetary instability. Accordingly, Buchanan and Wagner did not hesitate to attribute inflation to the decline of the old fiscal religion that had once exactly did not hesitate to attribute inflation to the decline of the old time fiscal religion that had once upon a time committed both governments and households to balance budgets and everyday austerity. Yeah, that's the old capitalism. That's the old capitalism. That's the pre ayn Randian capitalism. By creating uncertainty about the future value of money, they argued, inflation had the effect of shortening time horizons and inducing a desire of speculative indulgence among the consumer public. That's why we all have to be financial capitalists now. This in turn had led to the general breakdown in public morality whose effects were visible in everything from expanding welfare rules to sexual promiscuity. Nobody ever says this, but she just keeps, okay, we do not become full-blown Hegelians, they wrote. And look, look at how she throws Hegelians under the bus. They wrote, to entertain the general notion of zeitgeist, a spirit of the times, such a spirit seems to work in the 60s and 70s and is evidenced by what appears as a generalized erosion in public and private matters. Increasing liberalized attitude towards sexual activities, a declining vit vitality of Puritan... Okay, so they do say a, a declining vitality of Puritan work ethics, deteriorating in public qualities, qual quality, explosion of welfare roles, widespread corruption in both private and government sector, and finally, observed increases in alienation of voters from the political process. And that one is key. That one is a key point. You, you're not a citizen anymore. You get a vote willy-nilly. Your citizenship isn't tied to any any type of relationship that you have with the government. Okay? You're, you're born here, you can vote. Something like that. Who can deny that inflation plays some role in reinforcing the several of the observed behavioral patterns? Inflation destroys expectations and creates uncertainty. It creates... It increases a sense of felt injustices and causes alienation. It prompts behavioral responses that reflect a generalized shortening of time zones. Enjoy, enjoy. There is no future. It's the post-apocalypse. The imperative of our time becomes a rational response in setting where tomorrow remains insecure, where the plans made yesterday seem to have been made in folly. The American Hayekian, Henry Hazlitt, that was even more emphatic on his denunciation of the moral effects of inflation. Again, these are all the old school capitalists that believe in Lockeanisms. During the during every great inflation, the Lockeanisms that bound you know, household to all the to po property rights, there is a striking decline in both public and private morality. These, yeah, because we live in a world of neoliberal morality. And who is the utmost neoliberal morality? Trump. The, these theorists can all be classified as neoliberals of one kind or another, variously aligned with competitive price theory of the Chicago School of Economics and the Virginia School of Public Choice Theory or Austrian Economics, 
or Mises. Each, in his own way or her way, was associated with the resurgence and reinvention of radical free market liberalism in American political and economic thought in the post-war era. For all their singularity, however, the neoliberals offered an understanding of inflation that in the key, as key respects converged with that of the neoconservatives, political theorists who were otherwise opposed to the fundamental precepts of American liberalism. Of, uh, Political theorists who were otherwise opposed to the fundamental precepts of American liberalism, of economic liberalism. The economic liberalism died with Bretton Woods. Daniel Bell, for instance, perhaps the most famous neoconservative commentator on inflation, thematized the moral and economic crisis of the 70s in terms of, of very close to those of the Virginia School neoliberals in, in particular. His sociological classic, cultural contradictions of capital indicted the welfare state for undermining the proper order of familial relations and expanding consumption beyond the limits prescribed by the good Protestant sense. Again, these are the old Lockeans speaking. Now, what is it that motivates us to participate? It's neoliberal psychology that motivates us. It's all these girl boss memes that are doing the religious work instead of the Protestant's good sense. Inflation, he believed, was intimately connected to the breakdown of moral values. Time and again, both neoliberals and conservatives focused their attention on the one child welfare program in particular, AFDC, a marginal public assistance program that consumed a very small portion of the federal. Where? Where did the neoliberals do it? How did this great inflation of the 70s become associated with the breakdown of the family? Why? From, a, from my neoliberal perspective, I would say that, no, we need to provide um, AFDC so we can get both parents to get to work. Okay, this is where do the neoliberals align with AFDC? If a neoliberal aligns with AFDC, she hasn't actually talked about it specifically and she hasn't given a citation either. To answer this question, one must attend to the sinuous complexities of the political debate around the Fordist family wage and the social welfare state in the 60s and the 70s. I mean, this whole this whole argument is just on a platform of straw man, so I have no choice but to just follow along. By the historian Marissa Chappell, an initial effort to expand the family wage to African Americans in the 70s progressively gave way to a wholesale critique of family wage itself, a critique that became more vocal as inflation impressed itself on the political agenda. Uh, these are just these are just political. I, I don't understand why we take the politics. She she platform she she strawmans the academics to talk about this kind of thing. Like she strawmans Hayek, Friedman, she strawmans the left and the right, the academics, but then takes the political rhetoric and Iron Man's the political rhetoric. Why? This is just political bluff. I mean, why even take it so seriously? In effect, a bipartisan consensus on the basis of who knows what their intentions are. They have their own constituents, okay? A bipartisan consensus on the basic premises of redistributive social welfare existed right up until the 60s. Until this time, Democrats and Republicans alike were committed to the redistributive policies of family wage until this time, Democrats and Republicans were committed to the redistributive policies of the family wage. Although they were divided on the question of whether or not should it be included to include African American men. Isn't that your answer right here? That's the answer right here. Feminists never cared about black men, did they? Old Democrats and future neoconservatives, such as why is the why is the Democratic Party here ever of a leftist perspective? I mean, such a Daniel Patrick Moynihan were convinced that family wage should include African-American men, a view that they shared with many liberals and leftists in the middle welfare rights movement. A free market economist such as Milton Friedman preferred the racially neutral solution of basic guaranteed income, channeled through the tax system, although he reimagined pragmati prag pragmati pragmatically committed to a minimal system of income redistribution, a minimalist system. I don't understand. She just explains it and then... By the, late, by the late 70s, she explains it and then she just kind of lets it go. 
However, the consensus had given way to a comprehensive critique of the welfare state. Critiques of the left and right now accused AFDC and by extension the welfare state itself by radically, of radically undermining the American family and contributing to the problem of inflation. In response, to this, in response to this crisis, they now called for a much more dramatic reform of welfare than they themselves had hitherto imagined. It was now agreed that the redistributed program of the New Deal and Great Society would need to be radically restricted, even while the private institution of the family was to be strengthened as an alternative to social welfare. Welfare reformers now looked back to a much older tradition of public relief, one embedded in poor law tradition with its attended notions of family and personal responsibility as an imagined alternative to the New Deal welfare state. So here's my reading. Whatever, relig whatever religion that you could be of capitalist religion that you could be motivated by, that's good enough, okay? So some people have to be part of the old order having a, a, a reason to work as being something like the family. It is in this shift that we can now locate the simultaneous rise of neoliberalism and neoconservatism as mature political philosophies. Neoliberalism and neoconservatism may be diametrically opposed on many issues, but on the question of family values, they reveal a surprising affinity. Look, neoliberalism is about prostitution, and neoconservatism will, is about banning. Conservatism is about banning prostitution. I mean, I don't even know. This is such a, a masterwork of weaving together stuff to just make up a story. The controversy surrounding AFDC is in many respects illuminated by the peculiar positions it holds within the history of American welfare state and family wage. Unlike many European welfare states, and indeed unlike the welfare policies of the American progressive era, the American New Deal did not espouse an overtly gendered politics of the family. It was in fact more racialized, a fact that the Catholic Daniel Moynihan lamented. In its administrative and institutional form, however, the New Deal set forth a series of abstract category distinctions that sub subtly ser served to reinforce the privilege of white male breadwinner family. In its administrative form, the New Deal set forth a series of abstract category distinctions that, yeah, white, that's the point. By sorting citizens according to the purportedly neutral category of employment status, the New Deal created a welfare system that was highly divided among the lines of gender and race. Its panoply of programs, moreover, came under the jurisdiction of different levels of government, with federal programs administrating a far more impersonal, generous, and predictable system of benefits than the states, which were free to exercise considerable discretion in the distribution of welfare. The hierarchization of welfare benefits was further inscribed in the very design of welfare programs. Social insurance programs that targeted lifelong workers and collected contributions from workers or their employees enjoyed a much higher social status than the public assistance programs reserved for non-contributing poor. So if you are able to recognize that welfare is being used in nefarious ways, socially construct certain ways of living, in one sense, why can you not see that welfare can also be used as a way to socially construct things in another sense as well, mainly the neoliberal sense? That's what all these welfare programs do right now, right? That's what happens. You go, what, that's what happens when you are caught in the state. You are forced to participate in the psychology of neoliberal capitalism, okay? You're supposed to go and public assistance came from the rubric of relief programs that was highly dependent on prevailing public opinion about the de deserving or undeserving character of the poor. ADAC fell on the wrong side of each of these institutional divides. Aid to dependent children, as AFC was first called, was one of the mo many welfare programs created in the Social S Security Act of 35. Although it was a public assistance program subjected to a high level of public scrutiny and state discretion, it's inherited, it inherited its original structure from earlier mother's pension programs and therefore enjoyed a certain level of respect. Mother's pension programs had embodied the family wage ideal of the progressive era, which mandated that white women and their children should be supported by the state in the event of their husband's death. White women should be a uh -huh. The Social Security Act nationalized this program and reproduced many of its normalist, 
normative ideals. Unlike social insurance programs, however, they were heavily regulated by the federal government. ADC allowed states considerable freedom to enact appropriate funds with the result of many state funded programs many states funded the program poorly and were highly restrictive in their allocation benefits many states replicated progressive era rules that favored widowed women widows over women who had divorced or had never been married and the most southern states excluded african american women on the grounds that their work was needed outside their home the predictable result was at least in the five in the first few years of the program, most ADC recipients were white. I mean, isn't that happens uh, always? I mean, isn't that what the critique? Uh, in '39, the Social Security Act was changed to allow widows, formerly covered by ADC, to access more respectable old age insurance if they had been married to men covered by the program. This decision allowed deserving women to upgrade to a more respectable form of family wage allowance one that was pre premised on a woman's attachment to an independent male worker in standard long-term employment. But the elevation of certain class women, mostly white and middle class, to a more respectable social insurance program also led to the further devaluation of the status of ADC. By default, ADC was now primarily reserved for widows who had been married to poorer men and to unmarried, divorced, or separated mothers. Increasingly, it had become associated with the African American women. During the post-war era, the composition of ADC changed dramatically as the number of African American women signed up outpaced the, that of the white women, and more divorced or never married women joined the roles. These changes were linked to the transformation of the southern plantation economy and the racial composition of the forest labor force. The mechanization of agriculture in the South compelled many African Americans to mi migrate to the North Rust Belt cities where they filled non unionized and non insured positions in factories. Exactly. We're mixing a lot of different time frames here. We're mixing so many different time frames. We're back in 1939. Few African American men enjoyed the family wage privileges of the unionized industrial labor force. This is still the case. And as a result, as a surplus population of chief workers, African Americans in general experienced a disproportionate level of unemployment during the boom years of the 60s. In the North, however, state rules allowing the government governing uh, rules allowing the governing the allocation of ADC benefits were less restrictive than those in the South. By 61, 48% of African American women were on ADC, ADC. And many of these were single mothers. Although their numbers were far fewer than one would expect given the actual rates of poverty and out of, wed out of wedlock birth. This is a sad history and it's interesting how it's being... <sighs> Man.